The scientific revolution starts now. I've just published a book, Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, the world's first megaliths by Wooden Books, published in October 2023. And I've been researching this for like 20, 25 years, just the megalithic sites around the world and the mysteries associated with them coming in from several different angles, um, you know, such as who built them, why they were built, uh, their true purpose, the archaeoastronomy, the, the strange energies that have been recorded at them and things like this. So, uh, there seems to be a lot more to them than meets the eye. So it's one of the um, reasons we set up the Megalithomania conference back in 2006, which takes place in Glastonbury every year. Also, we run tours. Um, we, we do another conference actually in, in uh, November called the Origins Conference in Wiltshire. And that focuses on like the deep origins of civilization, where where we all came from, things like this. And um, yeah, we do a lot of exploring. My partner and I, um, JJ Ainsworth, my partner and her daughter, we we travel the world uh, on our own, but we also run tours to fund our kind of research and explorations. Very cool. And what's the what's the most pressing subject that you're investigating at the moment it's, it's got to be what is happening in southeast turkey um with the sites like gebekli tepe and karahan tepe but also you know there's other sites there's like 10 other sites on top of that possibly another 20 or 30 to be honest with you but what's coming out of there i mean this is astonishing because this is like a time of um exploration this is a time of discovery it's like going back a few hundred years to ancient egypt or or the maya lands or the jungles of mexico and guatemala when they were first uncovering these sites this is literally what is happening in southeast turkey and i'm amazed it's not much bigger news to be honest with you i think it's going to just explode in the next few years when people realize the significance because we're not just talking about the era of the maya we're not talking a few a few hundred thousand thousand years ago we're not talking about the era of the egyptians which is what five thousand maximum years ago we're talking nearly twelve thousand years ago we're highly advanced what i call a super civilization quietly existing but buried under the ground but all this time and no one knew about it until literally the mid 1990s so all these civilizations and cultures have passed through this area of southeast turkey and no one even the, the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Christians, anyone, no one knew it existed. They just walked all over it, didn't even know it was there because these sites were deliberately and very accurately covered over um, before they, you know, completed, you know, finished using them basically. Um, and so they've not been part of history. They're just sort of little legends and myths you can kind of pick up on, even biblical stories. The Book of Enoch, I think, actually sort of mention elements of the this culture. And so it is a huge huge research project for anybody i mean so it's probably going to take the rest of my life just to kind of exp study this and explore this um because you know it's going to be the next 10 years where they really uncover everything because only about one percent or maybe five percent of maximum has been uncovered and so you know when you look at these sites they're so sophisticated all astronomically aligned beautiful symbology elaborate carvings this just shouldn't exist at this time so yeah that is that is my main area of research for sure and and that's a really really unique situation that's very different from mesoamerica you know it's understandable that the jungles would grow over the pyramids but the fact that these are underneath the ground is very perplexing yeah can we talk about the they were buried because I've read a little bit about it and it seems like some people think it was buried intentionally. Some people think that it might've been, you know, slope slides that, that covered them. And I've never totally understood how people are so certain that they're buried because that's always a central piece of the presentation on Gobekli Tepe. Yes, that's a good question. Yeah, that's the, there is actually a big debate going on about that because Klaus Schmidt, the original archaeologist who unfortunately died a few years ago, um, put forward the whole theory that these were deliberately buried. And there's a good case for that initially because when you actually when they uncovered the site, especially Gebekli Tepe, we're talking about here, they found that the 
placement of the pillars there'd been repairs done there'd been things placed back into position things were laid out in a certain manner as though they would how they would have been laid out anciently and then the rubble was filled in around them and they're literally holding up the pillars in the center of these enclosures the rubble is so that this wasn't this what this wasn't if this was just caving in and falling down they'd all be knocked over but these weren't these were perfectly placed in the rubble in the fill and so you, you can't say that it's just it collapsing in on itself it just doesn't make any sense and there were positioned statues and artifacts in the rubble in certain places in the rubble so yeah so that that the idea that it was it had a, it all fell this is all the new archaeologists say uh, at the site and, that, and there might be a case of that to happen to some extent maybe you know that's why they decided then oh we better fill these in we better repair them you know because they're gonna it's gonna all fall in so there could be a mi bit of a mixture of both but if we look at Karahan Tepe um the head archaeologist there Neshmi Karam he's done some analysis and excavation of what's called the pillar shrine or officially structure AB this is an area we focused a lot of our research on and um, and when they uncovered that uh they found it was definitely deliberately buried and, and put back together it was it was no doubt about it um, and he did a whole paper on this it's published you know peer reviewed and everything um so that definitely was buried but also at caravan tepe we have lots even though it was covered over like gebekli tepe it was also uh almost like it looked like it looks like it was ritually uh destroyed or damaged and then covered over it wasn't even like it just f fell apart or into ruin it's like it was deliberately damaged so some statues broken in a specific place on the neck on the belly area and things like this um separated you know so it's part of a ritualistic thing that myself and jj ainsworth have recently been writing about um and so i think there's a mixture of deliberate damage also repair and reconstruction and then filling in and the kind of you know caving in a bit as well i think there's a mixture of all three but to say it's all just caved in i don't think is correct it just doesn't make sense when you look at the basic archaeology of it is there a sense that they were displaced by some you know subsequent religion was it like a conquering sort of thing that people were trying to get rid of the past or was it a continual culture is there any way to tell ritualistic damage of statues seems like a conquering culture to me yeah, it's like when uh, the Spanish showed up in, you know, let's say ancient Peru or something, they ritually burned all of the, uh, what are those knot tying records called? Kipas, I think. Yeah, yeah they, they, ha they burned all of these. And historically, they burned a lot of the codices too in, in the Mayans and tried to destroy, you know, they saw them as threats, as idols, right? As and like pagan. a lot. A lot of the statues that you see in museums in Europe, they have their faces smashed in. And I think that that's the from, Egyptian ones, even yeah. yeah. Like I think that that's from a conquering force coming in and wanting to deface the old ways. There's 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 a there's a case for what you're saying uh, in in some parts of these sites, perhaps. But there's also an element of why would if if that's the case, why would they go to the level of reconstructing, repairing, uh, putting things back in place, and things like this at Gebekli Tepe, it, and and play, you know even at Karahan Tepe, they place these beautiful stone plates and artifacts on back on the benches, and they were found like that. Some of them were broken like and then placed on the benches it looked like you know they weren't broken because of the rubble on top of them uh, and it's the same with the, the new statue that was discovered the seven and a half foot tall statue that was broken in three parts at specific places and there seems to be some kind of skull and head cult as well which because you find all these heads broken off the statues but they're both preserved as well um so it's hard to say i mean the fact that they would i mean if, if there was an invading force coming in the amount of time it would take to fill up gebekli tepe um they'd be overrun before anyone before they had a chance to fill in a few meters of depth you know so they had time to do that and then they decided to leave i think i think that's more likely if you look at the amount of fill they had to do because you know you can't rush that it wasn't rushed um and even the Karahan tepe the pillar shrine was perfectly preserved yet the statues in the main enclosure some of them not all of them were damaged some were in perfect condition when they were found uh, 
um, and placed and embedded into the, the walls or the benches or the rubble. Um, so there's, it's a bit confusing, to be honest with you. And you know, I must admit, it's not it's not straightforward as you think. Why they left is a whole different story. Um, it could be, um, I mean, you've got to think these sites were in use for nearly 2,000 years in some cases. And so they must have had a very good reason. It could be literally they used up... Um, the supplies, the land, uh, the soil, because they developed agriculture after they constructed these sites. Um, or they there was a, some kind of cataclysm. There's theories about this, and they, they were concerned another cataclysm might come. Or there's even a new research theory, which I, I've been introduced to, which I can't say much about yet, about the magnetic field became so thin and weak at that time solar radiation was actually uh, getting in too much and it was causing harm and, and, and disease and cancers and things like this so they had to move on um, and try and find a different location where this wasn't so bad so there's different ideas about that but i don't i, I don't know about the the invading army type thing doesn't doesn't make sense when you look carefully at the amount of time it would take to repair and fill in these sites yeah, and of course you'd wonder who that invading army was. You know, the, you would expect that they would, whoever they were, would leave a record of of having conquered somebody. Yeah, do we have bodies? Yes, yes, there are skeletons. Yeah, there are bones and skeletons. A few, um, very few have been found. Uh, I actually saw one recently in a brand new excavation at a site called Saberch, which is one of the sites. Uh, Eleven thousand years old. This site, uh, beautiful, beautiful site. Uh, they've only started excavating it recently, so there was burials inside one of the enclosures that we actually saw. And uh, but even in Karahan Tepe, they found human bones and skulls and things like this that we think. Um, but only parts of them were found, and they were placed in these circular kind of pits in the main enclosure. We know at Karahan Tepe, they were burying people under these smaller square structures, which the new archaeologists claim are domestic structures, although we believe they were more um, like mini ritual structures for pilgrims. And um, because they also had T-pillars in them. But they also found skulls with drill marks in them and scraping on them not long after death. So there was some kind of skull cult or they were stringing up skulls. There's holes in stuff. They could have put string through and, and hung up skulls as part of this kind of ancestor worship or death cult, skull cult. We just don't know. We don't know what they were thinking. We kind of There's actually images on some of the statues like Pillar 43 and another one found in Enclosure D where there's actually a body and then a head separate from the body as well and so and we also find like i said the statues with the heads separate from the bodies uh we find a, um, these this site and, and probably a couple of others as well so uh yeah they have found human remains so it's, it's definitely a thing but not much research has been done on it. um but um it seems like only a handful you know a few maybe a couple of dozen have been found so far and is that part of the reason that it's considered to be a site that wasn't inhabited, the lack of skeletons? Because I feel like every time that I hear about Gobekli Tepe, it's like this is a pilgrimage site or it's a gathering site, but it's not necessarily a place where people lived and worked and organized an entire complex society in situ. It seems like maybe the other Tepes are places where people lived, but I'm not, I'm, I don't yeah. know enough. There's a big debate about this at the minute. I mean, again, it's the same new archaeologists which are working there, which are trying to take away the idea that Quebecli Tepe and Karan Tepe are temples or sacred sites in any way. Mm -hmm. They claim in there, they call them now the enclosures, uh, special buildings, and they claim that all the small structures around the site are domestic dwellings where people lived. Um, now, and this is what they're pushing. This is their agenda now. Okay, what, uh, but we why? don't. Well, we don't know. It just doesn't make sense to us because because I think as well it goes against what Klaus Schmidt said, and these new archaeologists want to stamp their authority on I it see. as well. Um, and, but we don't know. They might be right. They might have they might have discovered things we haven't seen yet because they don't they don't give away too much. They don't let you see much of the site at Gebekli Tepe. They try and keep it secret. Don't want the public or other research alternative researchers to see it and things like this. Um, and Schmidt was the gentleman who did all of the initial work on the site. He was the main guy, yeah, Klaus Schmidt, yeah, German Archaeological Institute. He was a legend. I mean, we met him a few times um, like ten years ago when we first visited there. 
very very intense but also a very nice gentleman who let you have a look around and tell you all his theories even he's the one he actually told me and andrew collars when we were there once that he believed that they're going to find that this site is fourteen thousand years old at some point because there's there's other areas we think are older than the ones that have been excavated because only about five percent has been excavated so far if that but you know so to me i'm not convinced they're domestic sites that's just my view um but there might be more research that proves that because they found that all these square kind of or rectangular kind of buildings that you kind of enter through the roof or through the, the sort of side of the roof um but all of them have got these small benches on one side with a teepa a small tea pillar in it most of them have not all of them, most of them so that's strange if these were domestic sites why would you have uh a tea pillar which is probably a sacred object inside it so this is why we d it doesn't really ring true for us i mean if you've got big t pillars over there like all these things like why do you need one in your domestic dwelling it doesn't make sense but if it's a pilgrimage site and you're going there to do things and it's part of route you take around you know looking at you know these different places maybe had sort of um different meaning to them what it meant what pilgrimage meant you know we just do it from our perspective it may not have been all sacred it might have been a kind of a continuation of this hunter gatherer lifestyle they wanted to maintain we don't know moving about a bit so there's loads of these sites all over the area over 124 mile uh, region uh, as they call it now tas tapala stone hills project um and so i believe that it sounds more like these are pilgrimage sites to me and people will go there because there's no water source near gobekli tepe there's no water source near karahan tepe at all they have to collect water and harvest it and use it so if you've got hundreds of thousands of people living there you're going to suffer in the summers it's just not possible to survive there's not enough water whatever you do unless you bring it up for miles from the river which is several you know 10 miles away at karahan tepe is 20 or 30 miles away um wow. and so we don't believe that the people could have really a lot of people could have lived there maybe a few people could they knew how to survive but we found evidence of migrations coming down from karakadag mountain which is the main mountain where ankhorn we first uh created and that's just 60 miles north of quebec and they would come down there'd be this route during the winter they come down and move the animals around uh, for breeding and things like this uh, where well, the water would have been collected gazelle hunting was a big thing in the late summer and autumn and they would collect all that and in the winter they would go and visit these sites to do ceremonies and stuff and this fits in with our winter solstice discovery at Karahan tepe as well but also there's um you look at there's other types of sites like Navali Churi. Uh, you've got Yan Lahoyak, which hasn't been excavated yet. And you've got uh Cheanu up near Dia Bakar, for instance, that's further north. Brifilahoya, Kortik Tepe, all these are further away, but some of them are. But they're they've all got water sources, either streams, rivers, or uh or or, or kind of natural springs. You know and that's where you can clearly see what domestic dwellings all over the place with one or two temples there one or two t-pillar kind of enclosures you can clearly see the difference it's a massive difference whereas gobekli tepe and karahan tepe there's multiple temples and so there's and there's no water source so you know there's you know it make it's pretty logical when you start looking at it what 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 was going on is there a sense that the like, can we imagine what the climate and the landscape were like back then? I mean, things must have been radically different 12,000 years ago. So uh, I was just looking at the terrain around Gobekli Tepe. And so my favorite thing to do is to see uh, old lake beds on terrain maps. And it really looks like there was a massive lake that was around Gobekli Tepe. Like, because Gobekli mm. Tepe is on mm. this, basically, it's on this, like, set of hills. And then directly to the south of it is just a gigantic flat plain. And we live in the Pacific. You talk about Haran, Haran Plain, you mean? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. And so is there any Haran sense of like when that was last covered in water? Yeah. Well, no. I mean, there's, it's difficult. I don't, not that we know of. I mean, springs in Shanlifer. Uh, you have that uh, in Shanlifer City, and that's not far from us, only 20 miles from Gobekli Tepe. Um, so that would probably feed what you see in Haran Plain as well. Um, but no, there's no, uh, in the Tech Tech Mountains where Karahan Tepe is no water at all at whatsoever. Even the limestone doesn't preserve and hold the water very well. Um, we've looked into this 
quite a lot. Uh, you get grass, grass is grown around there, but directly around Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, it's dry mountain limestone it's, it's, uh, with a few basalt outcrops. Um, uh, for the Haran Plain, there probably was, I think that's got several springs like you get in Shanalurfa. Um, there may have been lakes there, but I don't think it was one big lake. I've never come across that before um but you know you know we don't know we're not sure uh, but I, I don't think so i mean but certainly i think there was water but it wasn't at right any and also caravan tepe and are higher up you got to climb up there it's not like it's just by the side of the you know route you're walking on this is you got to climb up this is like a job it's, to get up there well it's really interesting because we were uh talking to george howard about uh the Tal al Hamam airburst theory. And so, this is basically the paper that got published in Nature, which is like everybody's really upset about it because they mentioned Genesis right in the abstract, where they're like, hey, this probably was the city Sodom in the Bible, and we can show that there was this massive airburst during the Younger Dryas. And so, we were talking to him about it. it was, I think it was much later than the Younger Dryas. Was it? Yeah, like. Oh, Tal al Hamam was much later. Much, much yeah, later. you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. But. But the point was, is that we were looking at a map and I was like, hey, I think that there was a body of water that was between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea at some point. And both of them, Shiloh's always making fun of me because I see lake beds everywhere. And both of them were like, yeah, I don't know about that. And I reached out to some guy who studies the archaeology in the area and he's like, yeah, there definitely was about 20,000 years ago. Which is like off the, off the timeline. But I just, I feel like the Randall Carlson's popularization of the Missoula flood story has really changed the way that I look at landscapes because living in the Pacific Northwest and walking across those landscapes, you can see the marks of the water. And I feel like everywhere that you go or any map that you look at, you can see the, the imprints of water, even if it's long, long, long gone. Especially with plains, right? These really flat places. Yeah, I'm like, there's just no other way that you can construct something like that. And so it seems like it would make sense that at the time, like, because the Missoula flood story is right at the same time that the Gobekli Tepe would have been coming up. And so if you have this massive thawing of the glaciers, if you have this the, the biggest spring that's ever happened, it makes sense that there would be massive quantities of water in the landscape for a brief period of time. Maybe like, I don't know, a thousand years? But I don't that, know. That, I think it sounds like you need to go there, investigate this, and, uh, and tell us, <laughs> basically. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. It's on the map. It's on the map. Yeah, because I mean, it's just, one it's, thing. Yeah, one thing relating, just relating to that quickly, it is is the clearly Gebekli Tepe and and many of these sites were built just after the weather warmed up, you know, big time, you know, like literally within a hundred, couple of hundred years. It's about nine thousand eight hundred BC is when the kind of effects of the Younger Dryas were supposed to have stopped. Um, things got more, you know, habitable. And this is when it all kicked off. It all kicked off. But but there was actually sites, as we can we can talk about this if you like, they were older, they were in the ice age, they were in the younger dryas as well. Even near Gebekli Tepe, there's a site called Chakmak Tepe, for instance, which is about a thousand years older than or a bit less than a thousand years older than Gebekli Tepe. And there's several sites up near the Tigris River, which is further to the north, sorry, further to the east and a bit north as well, in some places like uh, like I mentioned, Kortik Tepe, Chiano. And a very interesting site called Bonchok Lutala as well, which are older, up to a thousand, thousand and a half years older than um, the sites around the Euphrates, like the Beckley Tepe, Karahan Tepe, and all those sites. So there's, um, yeah, there's a lot to think about, you know, a lot to kind of piece back together from that era. Well, there must have been something desirable about that particular climate at that point, right? That doesn't seem obvious today, because if you look at it, it's almost dust bowl conditions right now. And it and there must have I mean do we have a sense that it was forested or how no. different was it back then? It wasn't no it wasn't forested anywhere near Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe I know that for sure we've looked thoroughly looked into that. Uh, grasses on the other hand yeah you get natural grasses growing um, in the area you get kind of small trees you know small kind of uh, bushes and things like that. Um, into the Haran Plain you get uh, more more grassland more growth 
up at the Krakadag Mountain, you get more there as well. But it's, once you start get, getting close to the rivers, it all starts, you know, it all starts happening. Um, but that's one of the issues with um, how it seems like it was a really difficult place to do this. You know, mm. this was so unusual. I mean, because, you know, if we look at Karahad, Tepe, the Tech Tech Mountains have never had any natural water. No, even the, there's no underground water there, apparently. It doesn't hold the water well, the type of limestone there. Um, and even, you know, they, they built all these kind of wells, almost like bell-shaped underground things all over the area of the Tech Tech Mountains, near Karahan Tepe as well, where they collect water and, and kind of keep it, even little pools they've created there as well. And even there's an argument that some of the design of Karahan Tepe was to collect water because it was so desperate for it. Um, and so, yeah, there's... Um, when it comes to that, it's also like uh, Gebekli Tepe, the whole anti-Taurus mountains, all that kind of range there is very dry, very limestone, doesn't hold water. So it's like, why would they build here? It's like they were kind of trying to find the high points, which they thought was special for some reason. Mm. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense when you start looking into the fact that uh, that is the highest point in that area of Gebekli Tepe, that whole area. And also they found, a, they recorded a magnetic anomaly as well, right? In the center of a main enclosure there, which could be natural. There could be unusual geology meeting up there and things like this. Um, they're also on fault, they're very on the edge of fault zones as well. Uh, not directly on, but on the edge of them. Uh, the recent earthquakes were actually felt very slightly at Gebekli Tepe and at Karahan Tepe. Um, and uh yeah so yeah it's a lot a lot to think about but because because the reason why I've, I've looked into the wood the woods and the forest and all this kind of stuff because people are claiming that they had these wooden structures and roofs on some of these enclosures which makes sense for the smaller enclosures you know but it doesn't make sense for the big open air enclosures if they're studying the sky um and so we looked into that and it's like no wood has been found at any of the sites at all, not, not a splinter, nothing. Um, and no wood needed for large scale projects like roofs like this are anywhere near there, a long way away. Um, so it's hard to, you know, understand. I mean, they, but there's lots of shrubs, and bushes and grasses. We know that for sure. Probably really rich in grazing animals then. They must have been big meat eaters. Yeah, there was there were they were still hunter gatherers when they were building Quebecli Tepe and Carahan Tepe. They were still hunting mainly gazelle. That was their favoured choice of meat. Um, but also probably many of the animals they depict on their uh stat and their carvings, like canids, like foxes, possibly even dogs. There's a, there's a theory that there were dogs there. There's uh, there's even leopards as well, lots of leopard carvings that um Karahan Tepe. Um, but during like, during I think like I said, the late summer going into the autumn is gazelle season. And that's when uh that's what they found in the layers of Gebekli Tepe, which really interested me because it fits in with our theory that there was big events taking place around the winter solstice. Um because they found that there was feasting at certain times of year, later in the year, especially, uh, not so much in the other times of the year. So it's almost like they were using these sites at certain times. Um, and gazelle, you know, they were hunting them in the autumn. And then also in the autumn is when most of the water collects after the summer. And so they would collect all the water. So they have water and they would have meat for the winter. You know, that would be their kind of thing. They, they preserve the meat, probably dry it, you know, and things like this. Um, but yes, yeah, so, that, so that's, um, then they started domesticating things, you know, but that wasn't for a at least a few hundred years after it was built and this is when the whole agricultural revolution kicked off and this has now been proven that Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe specifically were built before food growing really kicked off although there were little patches of it here and there uh, things happening so that's really interesting so were they kind of like did they kind of instigate this whole agricultural revolution, the, the kind of farming ideas, the innovation for that, and then domesticating animals and other such things, uh, certainly seems a case. Are you watching the Demystify Sci podcast and wondering, what can I do to support this absolutely incredible project? Well, wonder no more, because you can come on over to patreon.com slash Demystify Sci and sign up to give us a couple dollars a month. Might not be a lot for you, but all those donations add up and they let us push this project to even greater heights. Why is it that people believe 
the agriculture came later, what what sort of evidence are people looking for? Yeah, no, I think that, that they I think they've proven it now. I think um that they for a long time, I mean they've just looked at the data and the dating of everything. Um and it's it's agreed upon by archaeologists and academics now, I think. It's taken a while for it to turn. But now they've got the you know secure dating of these sites. What um, sort of what sort of artifacts are you looking at? Like plows and things like that. What what would you expect to see for agricultural society? Well, they found like some like ten thousand grinding tools at Gebekli Tepe, uh, bowls, uh, different types of um, uh, stone artifacts where they were preparing food like meats, and grains. Um, so this is not another reason they think it's domestic site, but these weren't at the early stages of Quebecly Tepe. These these were a few hundred years afterwards. Mm. Um, so it, be it became this rather than built for this. Um, and, so, and the same thing could be said at Carahan Tepe as well. So that's pretty much that's pretty much that. I mean, but I mean, for a long time though, they were they claim that agriculture kicked off the whole build all these building projects but now they're saying it's the other way around um that th these instigate like, like it's almost like religion and the, the building of these sites these temples these well, i think they're memory spaces as well i think they're, they're much more than what people think the astronomical alignment alignments were being taught there and things like this it was a center of innovation and uh you know experimentation i believe they were working you know with um incoming people you know with different ideas and this is and they had to there's so many people getting involved because this, these are major construction projects that they realized we have to we actually have to provide food for these people how are we going to do it and so one thing as well which is a big debate which I, I find quite interesting and amusing is that there's evidence of beer brewing or some kind of beer gruel type thing being brewed at Quebecly Tepe They've even found evidence of grape wine at Cortic Tepe up on the t uh, Tigris, which is much older, a thousand years older. Um, and so they might have been doing it for beer. You know, mm. everyone's getting together, giving them some beer and some food. You know, the, it's just like a beer gruel. It would be like feed you and you get a little bit drunk. Um, uh, and that would be like camaraderie. Like the site let's all do this you know then you can move on you know and things like this so there's there's that debate well, i know that in up. the sumerian clay tablets they actually are assessing how many mugs of or how much beer they're going to need to give the laborers there's like a calculation of payment and it includes beer so yeah it doesn't seem too far out of no it, it makes a lot of sense it's kind of got a logic to it when you when you think about you know gonna put you into a slightly altered state they've never had beer before they don't know what it is it's a new thing it's like oh you know it's like let's have some of that um but there's also like you know there's also like um i believe that um that there was a, sh a much more shamanic mindset and so they were you know trying to f they were had an aware the elites did anyway they had an aware awareness of plant medicines like psychedelics um especially as they started getting really into uh you know there's evidence of different types of cattle you know like bulls and different things aurochs and their dung is what uh na naturally especially it would have worked in this climate quite well uh is what different types of psilocybin mushrooms would grow on as well so they were probably accidentally having their mushroom stew and suddenly they're, they're tripping the light fantastic you know by the end of uh, their dessert so it's like um you know you can imagine there's this kind of thing being incorporated into the whole um sort of process of uh th these cultures and after dinner one day somebody had the idea for agriculture <laughs> <laughs> but agriculture I mean, would be quite, in a, in, yeah. Innovation comes from like, you know, enhancing the consciousness. You know, this is like, uh, this is what they think is what Terence McKenna thinks uh, in his Food of the Gods and this big theory he put forward. That you know, even beer alone can do this, alcohol can do this, but combined with these other things, um, it can actually develop. That's when you start developing communication and proper language and symbols and things like this. And this is sort of could explain the abstract art that we find at sites like a beckley tepe because the artwork there is not normal it's abstract it's like highly kind of artistic and precise and unique and very fixed the, the, the style and template lasted solidly the same design spec for at least 
one and a half thousand to two thousand years, which is incredible. You know, so you know th- that that really intrigues me. That you know, there's something remarkable was taking place back then. Hey, how do you know that it lasted for a thousand years if it's carved in stone? They found um, when they in the fill uh, of Gobekli Tepe, they found. Um, I think some some things I can't remember exactly what, but they found found some animal bones or something like this, uh, some organic remains um, in some of the late levels, and they they worked out, you know, after they'd done analysis on stuff they found at the very bottom level, underneath the pillars, underneath the lower parts of the uh, first walls, and they just balanced the two out. They worked it out pretty much. They could work out uh, the, the rough dating, which is roughly. Uh, it's slight, slight, better, slight different theories on this now. So the new archaeologists are trying to change it again, and um, but yeah, I think I think it's roughly two thousand years or eighteen hundred years they were, at least. And they haven't even excavated all the site yet, so let's let's consider that. You know, it could be earlier phases we don't even know about. And by abstraction, you mean like human figures with animal body parts or animal heads, yeah. things like that, whereas. Maybe earlier in the cave paintings and so forth, you just see pictures of animals as animals, you know, so, semi-realist, actually quite realistic looking animals in some of these, you know, 20,000 year old cave paintings and so forth. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, there's a bit of both, I think. I mean, well, some of the Paleolithic stuff is is pretty crazy. I mean, it is pretty abstract, some of it. There's a lot of strangeness there as well, you know. But there, but Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, it is another thing. I mean it's it's like it's like it's highly developed and sophisticated when they decided to build it that's what it seems like they had a plan you know that's what it seems like but maybe they didn't and they just had these ideas emerging to right i've got to do this um but yes very odd i mean look at the the central t pillars of gobekli tepe right they're pretty intact they're like 18 feet tall you got what most of that is an upright thin pillar it's only like that wide um you got a t-shape on top which makes it, it looks like a separate stone but it's the same stone but it's just carved to look like that nothing on it completely blank but it's got arms coming down the side with a belt with all these symbols on it these abstract almost like kind of computer generated symbols um h's and u's and t's and things like this serpents and then um you got like halfway down in between the arm you got like a a canid or a fox jumping it's like what the hell you know you know and and then and then you have these beautiful it's like a shirt it's like wearing a shirt going down the front of the pillar with little v-necks or you've got a little kind of lunar solar symbols or you've got a bucranium bull pendant uh and all these other it's just and it's just so odd and like bizarre why is there no faces on the big t-pillars when they're clearly anthropomorphic why is there no legs why is it a thin pillar why not the shape of a human They've, there's other human statues have now been found uh so why would they go to such extremes and such strangeness um in their designs very abstract is there what's the sense about the structural importance like i know you mentioned that the wood wasn't there for a roof on these things but is there a sense that there could have been like reed roofs that could have supported people on top or because uh, it's this very strange design like the t-pillar just it it seems like it should have be holding up something else from an architectural yeah. standpoint. From an architectural viewpoint, yeah, but you gotta understand these were the first ever buildings on earth, pretty much. So, you know, modern architecture because we developed that. Uh, oh, she's holding a pen up. Hang on for a sec. Um, I don't know if you saw, but they basically dug up uh wooden carved beams that they're dating to four hundred and seventy six thousand years ago. In Africa. In Africa. Oh, okay. And so, uh, like, uh, they're basically uh, in one fell swoop, or like, oh shit, I think like that it's actually beautiful, beautiful uh, woodwork, right? I mean, we've added an order of magnitude onto the age of buildings on Earth with this discovery, which is really crazy. Yeah, because you got them, you got the mammoth tusk things up in Siberia as well, haven't you? Which is super ancient. I don't know. Those. Um, what are those? Yeah, I, I I can't remember exactly where they are, but uh, they're like they're, te- they're kind of like teepee like things built yeah. on tusks. Yeah, what? I mean they could, they could. I mean, don't get me wrong. I believe um, 
they could have bought wood in. Uh, if people are coming in from all these different areas and they needed some, there'd be communication. Like you, when you come, bring a few, get you get your boys to bring a few bits of you know, a few trunks in. You know, we need them this size, this, that, and the other. And so I think there's a bit of that. But I think when you're looking uh, from an architectural point of view, remember these were the first proper, okay, there were other structures, but these were the first stone buildings, enclosures, stone circles of this nature being made, really. Um, so, you know, the idea, I mean, I get a lot of debate about the, this roof theory, I've got to be honest with you. And it kind of, you know, the fact that there's no wood has been found and no wood existed anywhere near the site, I think is enough to say there wasn't a huge amount. The smaller structures is a different story because you can easily do that. And also the, the proof of all the astronomy now roofs will get in the way of that you know as well and also if you look carefully you can see that there's little slots for the stones to go in and they could easily be held up if the slots were deep enough and things like this um even even in the center because i believe that the, the small shallow pits they're currently sitting in uh were deeper you know and there was other things up around it as well um and they may have had you know other things going on there because um because if you look at the uh there's no there's no clear evidence of because on the tops of the t pillars in the central enclosure there's lots of cut marks on them but there's no evidence of beams of wood being on there and these cut marks they thought we used to collect water and then collect it for sacred purposes so why would cut marks what have, what has that got to do with holding beams up and there's no wood there's no scraping on them saying there was wood they would because they would have been moved around in the wind and things like this so there's no damage from the wood i mean there's three stones at Quebecly tepe and these are weathered damaged stones that have little indentations going along the top length of the t pillars and people have said oh that proves there was wood in them but it doesn't because the, they were clearly carved later and it, they may have decided to put roofs on them later somehow or they may have been for water collect water water would drip down and used in ceremonies and thing and collected and, because it comes from the kind of tops of the tea pillars which they revered as sacred so there's there's so many ideas and possibilities if there's any evidence of roofs i'd be fascinated but there isn't um and so the same goes for Carahan Tepe. If you go to other sites um, further afield, there's more evidence. But that's where wood was growing. It was near water as well. Um, there were domestic places and things like this. Um, and, you know, the, the types of shrubs and bushes that grew around the area, they would be big enough probably to place over small, the smaller enclosures and have the entrances coming in. That makes that makes a lot more sense um, when you start sort of trying to under, piece it all together. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if evidence comes forward that there were major roofs over everything, that would be interesting. But I've, I've got a guy called, a friend of mine, he's a graphic artist called Kevin Esslinger, and he's been working with me and another friend of mine on reconstructing Carahan Tepe and if it had a roof on it and we've got some really good graphic and imagery and video of this we're gonna we're gonna build it up and, and kind of get it you know as close as we can to what we think it was um but he did experiments based upon the winter solstice alignment as well that we discovered um and he and they, when he put a roof over it it just everything was pitch black you couldn't see a thing inside it so it's like hang on a sec there must be gaps in it as soon as you start putting gaps in it you think well what's the, how is that going to work if you're trying to create a roof to stop weather the gaps are going to let it in so you can't have it pitch black and you can't have fires in it because it'll catch fire and there's, so there's lots of you know lots of uh intricacies you have to kind of consider um when you're looking at the idea of roofs yeah, would you see evidence of fires being in there? Do you think from soot or anything like that? If, if that I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard of any, but there has. But in the in the so called domestic structures or the smaller structures, they found some evidence of uh, charcoal and things like this. And it seems like they because they know they had uh, potential roof entrances, which were it could stay open, so you could have the fire in the middle and things like that. Uh, but not in the not in so much anywhere else in the main enclosures. I don't think so. No, I think I think they found the odd bits here and there, but nothing substantial. That's one thing that's really interesting about this uh, ancient Turkish culture. Whatever, do, do we have a name for it? By the way, just this whole culture. Yeah, they call it uh, they call it Testepla, which yeah. basically means stone hills. Does that include or, like Çatalhöyük peoples? No, that's further. That's much further west, and uh, okay. that's like two thousand years after 
maybe 3,000 years after Quebec Lee Tepe. But they, they also have this same roof entrance thing, which I think is really that, fascinating. That, that's what that's what a lot of this is based upon. Yeah, yeah. But they've actually found wood there. You know, they've actually found it there. I see. I see. Oh, what I what is that, this? Uh, what are you guys talking? Well, about? at Chateau Hoy, it's Hoy. really interesting because it's like this complex of almost apartment-like buildings, and it's very clever because there's no doors on any of the buildings. The the only way you can access them is by ladders to the roofs, which is a really smart defensive strategy, I suppose. If you don't want people to just walk in your front door, you know. You don't need a security system if you could only get in through the roof. You just pull the ladder up at night, essentially. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. are there are there obvious entrances on these Gobeki Tepe buildings? Well, no. There's, weirdly, there's not, but there's no obvious entrances to some of them as well. Um, so it's a bit of bit. So people have just assumed it's like it was like Chattel Hoyak. Um, but you got to remember, there's multiple generations of building rebuilding moving things around walls being added and things like this so i would imagine there were like you can imagine you can see where there's probably steps coming down you know for starters in a couple of the the main enclosures of Quebec tepe um and uh but they found the weirdly they found these porthole stones like these window stones quite big some of them um and there's sometimes in the wall towards the north, for instance, uh, Karen Tepe is actually towards the winter solstice sun, which is the southeast. And but um, they in the, but they found quite a few of them in the sort of almost like in the center of these enclosures. And people are like, well, how on earth did they get in there? And these are the smaller possibly enclosures. And so, well, actually, maybe they were in the roof. That's that's how they got in. Um, and so people have assumed that that might be the case, but they they weren't you know it's, it's just no, no no clarity on this it's really strange because there are entrances to some of them but not to others but even the entrances appear like you would climb down in many cases steps that may have crumbled and rubble kind of gone over it and they they confused the rubble that was in the fill with what was actually there so that they kind of they're not sure in some cases so yeah there's still a lot to lot to work out at these sites yeah i wonder if there, is there any chance that the roof could have been some sort of thin almost uh, like countertop level of stonework as well that just shattered and turned into gravel on the floor? Oh, I haven't, I haven't thought of that. But interestingly, in the pillar shrine at Karahan Tepe, where you find these this kind of six by seven meter enclosure with the, this is one with the stone head sticking out. You can actually see, see him behind me there. Um, I sit there just uh, on the wall. And uh, that is that when they discovered that, rediscovered that the archaeologists, they found on the very top of it were these quite large slabs, like several, mm. 10, maybe six, seven feet wide. Um, and so people have wondered what they are. Quite a few of these large slabs are found across the site. So maybe that was part of it. Maybe that was part of a, a kind of temporary roof. Because as far as the astronomy is concerned, I've seen these theories about Stonehenge too, where it had a platform on top and the priest would be sort of divining the stars and speaking to the people down below. And you could imagine, you know, there's some heritage of this, even in the church with the crypts, right? The, the Catholic, the big cathedrals have these hidden places down below where, you know, they have the skulls or they have the, you know, secret ceremonies, things the like this. The relics and yeah. all the apocrypha. Yeah, I, w I wonder if there could be something like that going on. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't that wouldn't surprise. I mean, even like Karahan Tepe, it, it, they're, they're kind of almost semi-subterranean, many of the chambers there. They're kind of going into the ground. They're carved out of bedrock, which is astonishing, you know, in my opinion. Uh, very accurately, very beautifully done. Um, um, high degree of masonry skills. And there's small, and even within the main enclosure, there's little kind of wells that go down. And there's like, you could, you could get a human down there, you know, if you wanted to. Um, and then, and there's some shallow ones that have been there, stones placed on top of them, like sealing them and things like this. So, you know, there may be more to be discovered like that there. And, and this masonry, by the way, is the thought that this was all performed with flint tools? This is the story, yeah. And like uh, antler picks and things like this um but remember this is limestone this is different uh, different two different qualities of limestone you get the very high quality stuff in some areas and it goes to lesser quality most of the mostly they build in high quality limestone areas uh, but it's still quite tough but it's not that tough you know once you start getting into basalt territory and granite that's where it becomes incredibly difficult but they have found um these beautiful stone plates which 
really beautiful they're like uh something you find in ancient egypt they're up to like three feet wide some of them and the different types of stone they're beautifully polished some even have like indentations like cut marks in the middle of them and they're just absolutely glorious and beautiful and these were placed and this is how they found them on the benches at Karahan Tepe in between the tea pillars so these were like it's almost like it reminds it's very similar to a kiva of native american tradition uh almost identical the, the the way that you could describe some of them the way, and how they did things i'm not um, familiar with that that term what's the key it's like a sacred um sort of subterranean area where ceremonies would take place mm -hmm. of the anasazi and other other cultures in north america uh, they found them at check check canyon for instance um and you know, even Andrew Collins was describing these before these discoveries were made, thinking that's what's going to be found there. Uh, and, and there you go. You, and they have stone benches carved out of the rock, uh, plates and sacraments placed on, you know, like display areas around the benches. Uh, people would sit around with someone in the middle, you know, and this has been proven at Gebekli Tepe, like just the acoustics they've worked out there. that it sound, They were designed to have someone standing in the middle and giving out noise and, and sound from them, and everyone could hear it perfectly in these geometric-shaped enclosures, um, which is fascinating in itself. And so, um, so this kind of really, again, pushes the idea that these were sacred places. These weren't just domestic places. These weren't just special places for, you know, everyone gets together. You know, this was, it was quite intense ceremonial activity here. It feels like. It makes sense that the, un the underground would be really important to people as you know, they, they would see the stars and the sun and the moon go down under the ground each. Well, at least the sun would go down under the ground each night. Of course, people when they died would go into the ground and that there must have been this real sense that that's where the magic was happening is is down out of sight and there was something to be communed with down there the food comes out of the ground if you're gathering the, ground. the water comes out of the ground it must have been a very very important part of their cosmology all around yeah. the world yeah yeah no, i believe so yeah i mean um yeah the i mean all i mean basically if you if you consider the nature of i mean this is what I've, i think about all megalithic sites and this this era this kind of ancient era is that there's they just had sky and earth that was there there wasn't anything else <laughs> apart from going within and uh, there wasn't any distractions to take them away from both these things and so the combination of the two um i think were just part of their psyche part of what they did and how they survived how they kind of uh, observed i mean and so this is why i believe these were astronomical temples these were like they were studying the stars aligning to certain things they had to have a calendar in place for farming and animal domestication and birth of animals and stuff like this even the fertility cycle of humans as well we think we've written a brand a new article just published on graham hancock's website myself and jj ainsworth about this about all the different um uh, if we, we trace back lots of different winter solstice customs and traditions go way way back, as far as we can get and and applied that to Karahan Tepe and it all fits quite well. Um, and so we think there was something in that. And, and, and the winter solstice was like this peak of the year. It was like the kind of death, rebirth, regeneration time. This was like, this is what tradition state. Um, and even the whole Christmas thing, it, it kind of fits with that as well. When you kind of, um, you know, the darkness, then the light comes back on around Christmas day. Cause that's actually when the sun starts moving back north across the horizon after it's been still like rising in the same place for three days um, and things like this. So there's um, a lot to be said about that. And, uh, and a lot of that is to do with like going into the ground, especially at the darkest time of year, going into the earth and then being reborn from the earth. And that rebirth mythology is ever present in so many cultures. And I mean, an obvious offshoot might be the Mesopotamian story, the descent uh, into the underworld, and that's associated with Venus traditionally, I suppose, where which seems to somehow reflect something very human too. This idea of you know shit happens you you're kind of cast into chaos and then you you work your way out of it and you're reborn somehow stronger afterwards and there's there's this way that people i think were looking at the world around them as reflective of what was happening inside of them 
And, and I think that they designed a lot of these temples to reflect that process that was very unified. It was a very unified cosmology compared to today. Like today we have, you know, nature is this almost machine-like thing that's happening outside of us and we're sort of separate from it. But I think they, they looked at the world very, very differently than that in the past. And I'm not sure it's been very good for us either <laughs> in modern times. No, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I think there was a sense of Gaia, really, I think, you know, way back then. And uh, yeah, you mentioned you mentioned Venus as well. I mean, this is another thing that we know they were following. Just that incidentally, um, we've got some new new research on this. We have been an analyzing the winter solstice sunrise back then, and actually, every eight years, uh, which is part of the Venus cycle, where it forms this kind of star in the sky, returns to the same spot. Um, there's a point in the cycle where this happens and, and the sun that venus rises before the sun so while it's still dark and exactly the same movement as the sun would so even on the winter solstice before the sun rises venus rises once every mm. eight years more accurately every 40 years and it go, and it would be bright enough to illuminate the stone head inside the chamber like the sun does on the winter solstice so they so they they were probably tracking larger cycles and uh venus is useful for tracking and, and resetting calendars and things like this but the solstice is very useful as well because you can clearly see especially because the way they've designed Karahan tepe they clearly they've marked the winter solstice because this tiny hole 40 centimeters wide actually thinner because it comes through at an angle uh, when the sun's rising only on the time of the winter solstice it slits through there and this blade of light hits this head and over a 45 minute period it moves around the head like this mm. goes down into the neck and um and like no other time of year it works uh, it's the only time it's, it, it works and we've checked this over and over we've been there several times on the winter solstice to check a double triple check this and archaeo astronomers working with us to analyze it what it was like back then which would have worked even better um well, and Venus, Venus does this fits very, in with this. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, Venus fits in with this as well. This is what's so astonishing. And also, just while we're on it, uh, uh, there on the summer solstice, the moon follows the same path as the winter solstice sun. So the moon, when full around the time of the summer solstice, would illuminate the head through the, the hole as well. So you've got this double whammy on the the moon on the summer solstice and the sun on the winter solstice perfectly creating this calendrical probably the first megalithic site that recorded this on the, on the planet um as well so it's, it's all these little things and this is all part of um i believe this was all being created for the development of calendars and agriculture at the time this may have instigated it this may have actually been part of the, the kind of thing that, that triggered it and got it moving yeah, I think Venus is really special because it does this descent thing very slowly, right? So I think for about 250 days of the year, it's in. it appears in the morning, and then it disappears for around a week. And then it, for the next 250 days or so, it's in the evening. And so it really plays out this slow tr transformation, and it disappears into the underworld for a little while. And it just, it opens the mind up to all sorts of storytelling related to that in a very yeah. unique way that, that you see that those same stories appear in Mesoamerica, presumably unrelated, uh, just because it's, it's so fundamental to the way humans yeah. see their own stories. I mean, honestly, the, what, the sky would have been so clear back then as well, especially obviously at night. Um, my God, the things we're, we're kind of been observing using the, the program Stellarium and what they would have been viewing from these places is just beautiful. I mean, you can, um, I mean, so much of the symbolism you're finding at these sites is clearly what they were seeing in the sky. You know, clearly it, it must be. Um, this is why I think these were open air temples because they were they were observed. It was their thing. That's what they were doing, um, and they were monitoring it. They were recording it. They were carving it in stone. They were probably carving it in stone. And we 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 worked this out. We 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 witnessed this actually happen once the last this year in May actually, where we believe that. Uh, the very subtle relief carvings on these stones mark can only be seen you can't even see them sometimes they're so subtle you know if, if the light's not at an angle on it you can't even see it it just blends with the stone um and so certain times a year the sun will reach a point where it will just hit it and you'll you can suddenly see it mm. so it's like it comes out of nowhere um and you imagine these whole sites in these sort of circular shapes these geometrical 
ellipses and different geometry as the sun moves around think different things get illuminated and, and we believe there was a, a kind of annual process of um almost like a kind of annual ritual going through the whole year peaking on the winter solstice that would light up certain things then you do teachings and you know uh, stories and um star myths about that you know and and, and previous histories from the paleolithic era all bought in and marked in one place like a memory space mm. um so i think there was different you know different ways that they were kind of teaching this, this and it would be th more through symbols and uh stories than it would anything else and like each story would be revealed at the proper time of year yes so it and would, and it would a natural cycle of illumination yeah, and it would only be revealed then. That's it. That's so you, you wouldn't you wouldn't even you wouldn't be able to see it until that point. And then when you see it, you're like, oh, okay, we need to talk about this now because this is clearly now this time of year. You know, it's like the academic calendar essentially. Yeah, it's like, it's like a very very unusual esoteric abstract calendar. Yeah. Do you think and that there was a... meanings with it? You know, what was that last part? Well, they had their own meanings with that. You know, we don't really know what they all were yet. We, we're still trying to work that out. Yeah, do you think that there's a priest class of some sort who is charged with interpreting the meanings and then distributing them to others? Or do you think that it was something that was more fluid than that? Yeah, because one of the strange things about Chatal Hoyek is that it doesn't seem to have had a very stark class structure. I guess, that, at least that's the popular narrative that I've heard. Uh, is is it sort of the same thing over at Gobeki Tepe? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think i don't know i mean we don't know really but it's uh no one really knows but i think I, I think there was a, a priestly cast yeah i think they, 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 it kind of makes sense um i don't think they could really create these sites and this innovation without some people at the top you know making it happen Otherwise, there's just survival on your mind. That's all. That's all that's going to be on your mind, really. Just the next meal and uh, where we can sleep. You know, so I think there has to be some kind of. Thing. And also, the enclosures can only house a certain amount of people. You can't have the whole kind of thousands of people in them. You have a hundred, maybe seventy, something like that. The smaller enclosures, like the pillar shrine, you get two or three people, five people in there. You know, things like this. And so I think it was. Um, I think it was. I think it must have been there must have been some kind of um leaders kind of making this happen making stuff happen that's just my feeling uh but yeah but i, I think as the later cultures develop something jj and i've been talking about a lot actually is um it became more associated with goddess we find some sites like Gertrude Tepe, for instance, which have very specific goddess statues have been found there. And this is when you go into the era of Chadal Hoya, which is a very much a goddess oriented culture. And that's where things changed a lot, I think, you know, around that couple of thousand years. As Gobekli Tepe and all that were being closed down, we think, you know, that's when stuff started changing in it went in a different direction. Are these the uh, really the really well fed looking ladies that are Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really yeah, interesting. And, yeah, they're fascinating. And uh, you don't get much of that at Gobekli Tepe or Karahan Tepe, to be honest with you, but you do have more covert goddess symbolism. Something JJ Ainsworth is the expert on, she's my partner, who's I'm writing with at the minute. And she, like the cut marks are all over the sites, top of the pillars, all over the bedrock, everywhere. You have like there's a vulva stone, we call it, at the back of the site at Karahan Tepe, which is clearly shaped to look like that. There's only a couple of statues at Gobekli Tepe. There's the birthing goddess. There's one goddess statue holding a human head or a baby. We're not sure. Um, and one other small pendant. That's about it. Um, at Karahan Tepe, the name of Karahan Tepe, the, the actual original name isn't Karahan Tepe. It's Ketchli Tepe. And it was got changed in 1997 by Bahetin Selik, local archaeologist who was they did it you know to, to stop looters knowing where it was but the, the area is still called ketchley there's a hill to the north still called ketchley ketchley kec part of it as a feminine origin it means um uh like woman, basically woman daughter maiden queen um it has slightly different variations in kurdish um as well but also like gebekli tepe means pot belly or navel hill like a pregnant mm. belly you know also gire mirazam means hill of the wishes and things like this when people go like women will go up there give wishes for a good birth for fertility purposes uh with the sacred mulberry tree the wish tree which is on top of 
Gebekli Tepe. So there's even the names of them have a kind of uh, two main sites anyway have feminine roots. Well, that's the thing about that figure is it's it's unnaturally I don't know obese. I guess it's it's it it would take some effort to you would really have to dedicate a lot of food to one person in order to to get that kind of a a phenotype, right? I was I was just really struck by how accurate. It looks, right? Because if you've never seen a fat person, I can imagine that you would kind of eyeball the way that weight would be distributed or the way that fat would cover it and kind of approximate it. But it, th- this was a figure that was on the Wikipedia page. And I was like, this is a stunningly accurate representation of somebody who's really, really overweight. Like the way that the body carries the mass is accurate. And to me, it seems almost beyond comprehension that they would have enough food Unless they were like, unless they were some sort of vestals, right? Some sort of priestesses that that were given, you know, that were plumped up like this. Yeah, yeah. What do you make of it? What is? Well, I think it's. I think yeah. I think I think the yeah. They were clearly special um, people of their culture, and I think uh, um, they were revered because this, that represented abundance. That represented vitality, and uh, you know, um, just just largeness and, and vitality everything you can think of it's a, it's a positive quality it's not like a negative thing like we see it today it's just the way we interpret people who are, are large people i think there's uh different different ways to approach that because they you know they may have lived just as long or longer than um the other people at that time we, we don't know what it what it meant to them but clearly it was something else um but we do have a lot of statues remember at Quebecli tepe and now at carahan tepe where it's the opposite where we see emaciation we see ribs we see what appears to be people who are not nourished in any way they need nourishment you know so this went the other way a place like Chattel Hoyak, it kind of turned a corner and went a different direction. And so what what does that mean? What does emaciated statues, loads of them, you know, Quebecly Tepe, animal on animals, on humans, everything. What does that mean? You know, how is how does that compare? I'm actually asking you here because I'm not sure. How does that compare with the large figured ladies as well? You know, it's a, it's There's a, something it's a, about like, fasting, right? That's really <clears throat> you know, you talk about psychedelic experiences. I think one of the natural ways to achieve psychedelic states is by not eating for a very long time as well. And I, I wonder if that played into the mystical relationship with the cosmos. And That's it. That's something Andrew Collins actually has uh, kind of pointed out to me a few times um, that he thinks it could be that. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that as well because he sees it as a kind of a ritualistic, like a shaman, a shaman would do that. Know, go into the cave for a few days and you know not eat anything or drink anything to reach this heightened state of awareness uh, so that's one that's one interesting thing but what you know firstly why would, you know that it's on animals as well uh it's on different statues so we, we've questioned that we, we've considered that and we're going to pursue that a little bit but also could it be a symbol of um like a ritual thing where people are actually struggling to get enough food together as well. It's, it could be, it could be a simple practical thing like that. So they represent that in their statues and then they kind of would break the statues or bury them or something to hope for the opposite, you know, things like this. We don't know, you know, we don't, it's pure speculation here, but yeah, I mean, I think what you said there may, may make some sense. In terms of the motivation of building something like, Gobekli Tepe and organizing all of these stones and having celestial teachings and all of these rituals, it's a really complex series of actions that appear to come out of nowhere. And just the coordination. Just, just the coordination and the the impetus, right? It's you you have to have a specific bent to be like, you know what? I think there's cycles, and we're going to start keeping track of it. And we're we're going to do is we're going to carve it in stone. And you have to really convince a lot of people that this is a good idea. And it seems like there would be a place where there would be a dry run of it of some kind, or something that predates the first complex stone structures. Because it seems like what you're saying is that we have Gobekli Tepe, and then 2,000 years later is uh, Chatalhuyuk. And so there, there's I st- probably... I think the stone circles are very ancient in terms of calendar. Like there's... Uh... I, I don't know the name of it, but in South Africa, there's a very, very old stone circle that's somehow marked up to the calendars. I think that stone, like 
very rough hewn stone circles go back very, very far into prehistory. Yeah, is that is that the case? Like, what's the oldest? Uh, well, you're talking about Adam's calendar in South Africa. And there's there's so. no there's no proper dating has been. I've been there actually. There's no proper dating has been done on that yet. That um, they're considering it super ancient, but the no, more research I believe needs to be done. Um, but but what you're saying about was there a predecessor to Gebekli Tepe? That's one of the big arguments against Graham Hancock and his recent Ancient Apocalypse series, because he claims there were things in the Ice Age that were taking place, and um, there were civilizations there, and then uh Gebekli Tepe was kind of a reaction to the end of the end of the younger Dryas uh but if you look I mean I mentioned these sites already Kortik Tepe Bonchok Lutala Grifilohoyak nearby Gebekli Tepe we have Chakmak Tepe um and we have a couple of other areas even Karahan Tepe they found evidence of kind of occupation in that hill going back about a thousand or one and a half thousand years before Karahan Tepe so that would be before Gebekli Tepe but no building there until that time at uh, 9400 bc but these sites up on the uh tigris i mentioned uh do have evidence of starting to live in one place like kind of moving into one spot you know building small constructions out of mud brick and stone living there with small temples there as well at cortic tepe they found these stone you can almost fit them in your hand these stone stones basically but on them are 3d re- they've carved it away and there's 3d relief carvings of abstract animals and figures on them so this is to me that proves that at least a thousand years before gobekli tepe they were experimenting with 3d relief carvings and so they were doing that there and they were experimenting with small enclosures and places to reside and things like this so there is a development you can see it there is there is it's not just gobekli tepe came out of nowhere i think now they've done more research and more excavation they're realizing there was a lead up to that and it also suggests that the people of the tigris came down you know southwest towards the area of Shanla for where all these main Tastebola sites are and got things going, you know, and other migrations coming in from different places. So it's like a sort of meeting of minds, meeting an innovation area. And it all kind of kicked in when the weather improved, basically, after the end of the last ice age. And they realized, I think there was major hunter gatherer populations going back to Paleolithic times had recorded all their knowledge in oral traditions and landscapes as well this is like the aborigine um song lines um idea and i think that these people were doing it as well so they, they had they had memory uh memory things in place where they could retain all the knowledge they recorded including astronomical cycles and so when they decided to stop and actually start you know putting this in one place they bring on this knowledge and they re- they put it into stone they would carve it into stone initially. And they would have to do that uh, probably from the people from Cortic Tepe who could do that because they they were capable of carving 3D reliefs in stone. And so, you know, we, so there's a, you know, just, just just trying to piece it together here. This is kind of what, what you know, it sounds like took place. There's lots of different um, ideas coming in from lots of different places with skills. And it just happened. It needed to happen. There needed to be a place where all this knowledge that they'd recorded through the hunter-gatherer uh ancestry and lineages going back thousands of years that they've memorized they needed to put it into place because you know we need to be teaching this now we're going to be here let's just put it down um and 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 so on and so forth then probably the combination of uh the accidental beer brewing and the natural psychedelics in the area may have inspired that as well are th- is there a sense that there's a a big road network that's connecting all of these places? Because I know that even out west, I mean, obviously this is much more recent, but you can still see the traces of the Oregon Trail where the the carriages passed and people walked and animals walked. And it's not like somebody built an actual road. It was just kind of cleared and compacted over time. Yes, the- there are. Yeah, there's some, I mean, there's a lot of it has been built over um, and a lot of it, it's, re- it's actually really hard to find it. I mean, because even in Karahan Tepe, you would expect there to be a route there, different places, but there's nothing clear and obvious that you can kind of uh, work out, to be honest with you. Even at Quebecly Tepe, you, you know, you feel like you're climbing, you know, before they built all the roads there, you were just climbing up a rocky mountain. It was a bit of a nightmare. But apparently there are routes. Uh, this was uh, put forward, I think, by, this is before the whole Taz Tepe project. Someone put this map of all the sites together and worked out there were, 
possible routes through valleys between different sites, more or less straight lines almost, not exactly. Um, but yeah, so that so they, they must have been because there was definite communication. There's no way you can, um, you know, build Quebec and Tepin and all these other sites have the same design spec within them unless there was, you know, communication and uh, traveling between these areas. Now, the Tigris has come up a couple of times. Is there any sort of connection between these peoples and the first peoples of Mesopotamia? Because the Mesopotamian culture is very, very strange. It's a language isolate, which has always perplexed me. It's, it doesn't seem to be related to the indigenous uh, peoples by, by way of language, at least. It seems to have kind of come out of nowhere. But it is built on this same... We're talking about the headwaters of the Tigris, I assume, up here. Is, is there any sense that there was diffusion of this culture that, that set up some of the seeds down there? Because they must have gone somewhere after it was filled in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I think there is. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a long, quite a long distance between them, but it's the same landmass, the same rivers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you look at, I mean, one of the things myself and JJ have been doing is re-looking at all the Sumerian stories you know, and realizing that they may something, I one of the things, for instance, which is very, I believe proves there's a connection is that in their stories, they talk about the great seven sages of Suma, the Anunnaki, they call them or Ananage and or, or different uh, things. And they talk about them creating and building wooden and stone structures on the Duku mound, you know, up, up, um, and below this Duku mound is where they started agriculture after they had constructed these buildings and after they created these irrigation channels and after they created calendars, then they started growing food and domesticating animals. So that fits in exactly with what science is now saying, where the structures were built first and then they did all the agriculture. Uh, that's when it all began. So, so there's a, a kind of, I believe there's even some of the the stories of the creation of man, like with Ninha Sag and uh, El Enki and Enlil and so forth. Um, they talk about like you know this male fertility, um, you know, being very prominent, especially with Enki and Enlil. And there's lots of male phallic symbolism and fertility symbolism at Karahan Tepe and Gebekli Tepe as well. There's also the story of Ninha Sag, the Lady of the Stony Ground, something JJ has been researching a lot. Um, and even the descriptions of her being like this birthing goddess, this mother goddess, this stony ground goddess and um, fertility goddess fits in with some of what, you know, some of the symbolism we're even finding at Karahan Tepe. And so, you know, we could be just, speculating and accidentally putting things together that aren't there but there's certain things which seem to suggest that there are connections and i think that there's i mean you look at the progress of sites after um gebekli tepe and, and after they closed all these sites down then you have sites further south like um was it tel caramel in syria you have uh jericho uh down in the kind of uh palestine israel area uh, and so on and so forth. And so I believe there's there must be a connection there. And I think uh, when you start rereading the Sumerian stories, you know, you've got to remember the Sumerians wouldn't have known anything about Gebekli Tepe or Karahan Tepe or the Tas Tepela people because the stuff was completely covered over. So, you know, that the, the, they may have been recounting stories they didn't really understand or how this could have been where it really took place along the Tigris and the uh, Euphrates. It could have been anywhere along them because they go all the way up, you know, to like that part of Turkey. So, yeah, so there's a lot of lot of debate about that, but I think, I think there has to be connections there. Well, the interesting thing about rivers is they're kind of a one-way street. So the way that the crow flies, it seems like it's far away, but you can imagine it's quite easy to get from upstream to downstream. And so they might have a lot of infusion of peoples coming down the river, but not a lot going the other way. So you wouldn't be able to really investigate or speak maybe in one lifetime about something or have gone investigated it and come back. It might just be receiving a lot of, of uh, you know, even, uh, even artifacts, I don't know, even, but at least stories, uh, myth common mythologies. The, the Oryx, right, also appears that the cattle... The, the bull is really central too in uh in some of these Akkadian and 
and Sumerian deities, as far as I can tell, certainly in the um, the Canaanite traditions around maybe a little bit later, very, very, very central. And, and so that's interesting as well. Yeah, you get you get the bull, uh, the Auroch at um, Gebegli Tepe, you know, some of the later enclosures, also at Cycle Sabirch on the panel that's been discovered there. Um, and they've got Bucranium, you know, um, pendants on the main tea pillars at the center of Gebegli Tepe you know, amongst other things. And so, yeah, so that, that, that symbolism is prevalent there as well. Are the Sumerians considered also to be megalithic builders? Not so much, because megalith is just literally large, mega, large stone constructions. They certainly, you know, we know they built the ziggurats. We know they had very large, well, especially the Assyrians, a very large kind of half animal, half human entrance kind of guardians you know find some of the british museum um but yes yeah, so they had megalithic elements but not i didn't entirely construct from large stones and you think that that's just a stylistic choice or you think that that's a significant transition no i don't know i think it depends on where you are um i think because the Tech Tech Mountains and the, the mountains around Quebecly Tepe are very useful limestone. So you've got everything you need. There's not much clay to make. There's not much uh, wood. Um, so, you know, the, I, I, as far as I'm aware, the Sumerians built with those uh, things because it was there. They were by the river, mm. plenty of wood available, plenty of clay and mud brick and things like that that they could uh, build with. There's one more thing that I wanted to tell you about, and that is our very first in-person event. It is Demysticon 2024, and it is happening in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th to coincide with the total solar eclipse. We're going to get a chance to get together in person and talk about all of the big questions that you have while watching and see all the talks in person live for the very first time. Tickets are up here. If you cannot attend because Austin is just too difficult to get to, we are also selling tickets to attend the virtual event. And so come on over, check that out, and we hope to see you in Austin. Yeah, so I, I'm curious. We, we've we kind of talked around uh, Karak... Is, am I saying that right? Karakan? Karakan? Karahan Tepe. Karahan. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, we sort of talked around it. Um, is this a newer discovery, or what? what's attracted you to this site? Yeah, it got discovered originally in 1997 by Bahatin Selik, who's a local archaeologist. and I first visited there in 2014 and basically it was unexcavated and so it's still buried but at, at the very tops of the t-pillars were sticking out of the ground in some areas so you could just see this little uh, slab it looked like on but all in neat and in neat places like doubled and things like this and then at the side of it on the west side there's a big 18 foot unfinished half carved monolith t-pillar and there's a few artifacts, a few pieces lying around. Uh, there's another hill to the north, which is now called Ketchley Tepe, but the whole area is called Ketchley, just the original name of Karahan Tepe, which has got caves. It's got like square rock cut bedrock areas and things like this. Well, I made a whole uh, extended video about this and the investigation we did there. Um, but only in late 2019 did it start being investigated uh, and excavated. And so that's when it all began. And so this was all, then the COVID hit. And so they were still excavating. They still did quite a lot of excavation. And we got to visit there in late 2021, where most of it, the first phase had been excavated. And they announced this big announcement at the end of September, early October of 2021. And this is when it kind of came out to the world. So we went over there. We tried to go there before then. We tried to go there in like October, but we'd already booked to go to Crete and things like this. So we made it over there in December. Um, and we weren't really going for the winter solstice, but we, we'd ended up being there exactly on the winter solstice first thing in the morning because we'd been told that they were closing the site down for a while on that day. So we thought we'd better get there early to make sure we actually see everything. And that's when we made this discovery of this winter solstice alignment, uh, which kind of blew our minds, which is the oldest one known on the planet really. And, um, but yeah, so it's only since really the last couple of years, maybe three years, it's actually been excavated ever, you know? So this is like brand new and the main enclosure is about 70 feet, or more wide you've got the pillar shrine or structure a b the main enclosure is structure a d 
by the way. Then you've got structure AA, it's another sunken enclosure. And now they found all these other enclosures around it. And more up on the hill, actually, this year they announced a new discovery of some statues and a new enclosure up the top. Um, giant, you know, six, six meter tall, uh, 20, feet, uh, 18, 15 feet tall T pillars and uh, this, these statues I mentioned. Um, but yeah, but a lot of this is actually carved out of bedrock and the pillar shrine particularly is utterly unique, which has these 10 kind of almost like phallic shaped pillars carved out of bedrock. They drilled away the bedrock to the bottom and then a freestanding, like half a hold stone, like a half and kind of porthole stone. It's almost like a half a serpent coming out, like five feet tall. Then with this big stone head coming out of the side of the western side with scales down its neck with an open mouth, but its eyes looking towards the whole stone, which is, goes out towards the southeast. Um, and so this is what the alignment of the, with the solstice sunrise comes through, and it would come through the main enclosure between the two central pillars, which has all been quite badly damaged through the hole, hit the stone head on the winter solstice morning. Um, so this, and then they've realized that the whole area, the whole hill, in fact, and even into the valleys below is the site. So it's huge. And they've only done a very small percentage, like one to 5% um, excavation so far. Who are the teams that are doing most of these discoveries at this point? Are they Turkish teams or are they international teams? Are they mostly academic? How, how do you even get involved in discovering these new sites? At Karahan Tepe, it's run by Neshmi Karal of Istanbul University. Uh, it's a Turkish team at the minute. They have international students come in as well. Like Habit Zuvan, another site in the area, is run by a Japanese team. Hmm. There's Sefir Tepe, that's run by a European team, I think from Holland and Germany, or Germany. And um, Gebekli Tepe originally was a German archaeological institute project. They're still involved, but it's run by um, Istanbul University now, I think. Neshmi Karal is ahead of that as well. And um, and there's different groups coming in to analyse and study different areas. There's a Turkish team doing um, Sabirch, there's Kachmat Tepe, Sorry, Chuck Tepe. I'm not sure who's doing that exactly. Um, so, yes, yeah, so like an international project, but run through the Turkish government. It's like um, they're trying to promote this as a big tourism thing. Uh, they're trying to promote this um, from an archaeological perspective. They call it now Zero Point in Time. That's their kind of tagline. Um, they used to have the, their, their tagline used to be the world's first temple which i thought was great i mean that kind of worked for me and so we actually borrowed some of that title from my book called the world's first megaliths um and we you know and and it's quite an amazing project i just wish they would allow more access to sites like gebekli tepe um because so a lot of it's been excavated and they won't let you go there and i, I want to i might do a campaign to push that to be open more and to have, you know try and to allow people inside the enclosures and things like this because they're very restrictive but also they're trying to preserve it at the same time because it's very delicately poised um you know with extreme weather it could affect damage things if they don't get you know they built a roof over gebekli tepe now they're considering one at karahan tepe um and um yeah the list goes on i mean and so many of the sites many of the sites they're actually talking about haven't even started excavation yet we've been to many of them we've actually found I actually found myself me and jj found a, a chunk of a t-shaped pillar on the ground on a sort of random farmland at one of the sites that hasn't been excavated so you had carving and we were like what the hell why isn't this being taken to a museum or something um we met the local mayor of one of the unexcavated sites one of the it's like a mayor of a village you kind of get that there and uh he showed us all these artifacts they found uh we even got access to uh a hundred meter long cave carved out of the bedrock going down at a 30 degree angle which is stunning uh which i can't say where that is it's a uh, private property but we've got permission to go and investigate that we're going to be going back there next year to analyze it and record it more thoroughly uh but that is an engineering marvel in its own right and it's right in the heart of one of these unexcavated sites um is there a sense yeah, that we, that's that's related to taking anything out of the earth or was it you think it was ceremonial was there any evidence of mining or anything like that no, I don't. I don't think it's mining. I mean, the only thing that there is there is water. 
I mean, it's 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 a spring in that area. Um, it's one of the few sites that has a spring right at the heart of it. it actually, feeds Channel Earth, like the pools of Abraham, and everything. Um, and so that is interesting uh, in, in its own right. Uh, but no, we don't know. I mean, honestly, even the people there don't know. The locals don't have a clue. They, they just don't know who built it and when it was there. It, it was just always there. Um, and it's right. The thing is, it's at one of the sites in the middle of one of the sites. It's one of the huge sites in the area that hasn't even started excavation yet. So, yeah, so we're finding things just by looking around. Uh, we found a whole um, load of stuff all around the area, the village of Saybirch, for instance. There's not just what's been excavated, uh, which is this beautiful oval or half an oval enclosure with this beautiful panel with this is what's got the bulls on it and the uh the leopards and the human holding this phallus with the v-necks and everything beautifully 3d relief carved but there we got chatting with the family became friends with them over the over the years and they've they said oh come in here we went in this building and, and it led downstairs into this huge rock cut underground room and we were like what so that really surprised us um that that was even there it's like well who the hell built this and then that there was another level below it it was almost like uh, something like Darren Kuyu, like the underground cities you find in Cappadocia. Mm. Um, and so there's um, but a small version of it. And so there's, uh, there's a lot of potential um, coming out of this area. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be, I mean, we're fully in, in it now. We're, we're involved. We want to, you know, even though the archaeologists don't like us very much, um, we still go there regularly. We, we, we go there a few times a year. Often on the winter solstice, we head down there. Um, there's a lot of bad weather predicted for this year, so we, we may have to skip this year. We're going to go back next year. But we've been there two or three times this year already because we take tour groups there. Um, we, we, that helps you know, fund our kind of research. Also enables us to do research while we're there. Um, you know, it kind of helps with that. And, uh, yeah, and we find things when we're on these tours sometimes, which is even more weird. You know, we have talked, some of the tour members have got really good eyesight and they spot things we, we hadn't noticed before. Uh, in fact, back in 2015, there was a bone plaque in the museum. It had just been put in the museum. It's so small. It's like three inches small. And, uh, and it was at the bottom of this case where the glass was there and it was down there. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't really see what was on it, but a friend, um, matt smith had just had laser eye surgery mm. uh which was handy so he spotted it and like oh you know and could see what it was and on it and this little bone plug three inches tall it's in my book actually it's got what appears to be a person with two t pillars and him looking between them which was like what the hell so it was the first you know pictorial representation of one of the enclosures ever it caused a sensation way back in 2015 um and now, <laughs> this is how much the, the archaeologists try to refute it, this, that, and the other. It's found in the filling, the Beckley Tepe, uh, saying, no, it's not that, it must be something else. Uh, and then we go back to the museum, and they turned it over, so you can't see it anymore. Whoa. This is the kind of pettiness we have to deal with, uh, Yes, yeah, so like, what wow. do you make of that? Because it, it doesn't totally make sense to me that there is this super aggressive refutation of i don't want to say hobbyist but perhaps non-academic researchers oh there is trust me there is yeah we've actually been uh kind of almost like abused when we visited quebec we tip with a group in 2018 by the head archaeologist not neshmi corral by the way he's he's quite cool um and uh at the time I think he was the head archaeologist. It wasn't Klaus Schmidt, but the, and we got we got harassed. We got yelled at, called us pseudo scientists. You can't be here. Oh, how dare you write about this? You know, yelling at us, and we're like, what the hell? Is so yeah, we like were quite surprised. Territorialism? What's going on? I don't know. I've, I, I've been I've been so uh, that, shocked by the way that people react to Graham. Hill. Yeah, no, it's, it was strange. It's a very strange experience, but you know, we forgive and forget. We go back there. We see the archaeologists, everything's fine. Um, we're not too worried about it. It's just, whoa, you know, it's kind of surprised our tour group. Um, and uh, But, yeah, this, this 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 kind of thing does happen, especially the turning over of the plaque was really frustrating um, because, you know, people need, you know, it's a very important artifact, and they've deliberately obscuvated it so you can't see it. You can't see the correct, what you want to see. So, and uh, even though we wrote a report about it. Yeah, wrote a report about it, made videos about it. 
and uh, and everything else. So that's frustrating. But this is what a lot of a lot of non academics have to deal with, and we don't mind. I mean, we just you know we don't care. Water under the bridge. We just crack on um, and do what we we want to do. Um, but you know, thankfully, these archaeologists are doing great work. They're excavating. They're putting a huge amount of effort, money going into it, and you know digging and teams working discoveries are being made and it's it's being published people can see it uh most of it so yeah so it's uh you know i've got to give them credit um and Nesmi corral is is doing a great job i think at caro um i really i really like the way he operates and just gets things done uh accepts you know weirdos like us turning up there you know whenever we want random times of uh, sunrise or you know any time of year and uh and also you know we've got to know the families and the uh kind of people who run the sites as well we become very friendly with them we're very generous with them and everything and um and, and we big them up you know we kind of you know do what we can to help them and uh yeah it's a good it's a good thing you know but it's just it's the nature of i think um when alternative non-academics are publishing books and articles and going on TV and doing podcasts about stuff they feel that it's theirs, um, sometimes it rubs them up the wrong way, unfortunately. Do you think that there's something about the theories that are being proposed outside the academic landscape that is anathema to the academics? Is it something that's substantive, the disagreement, or is it yeah, I mean, I think they don't like anything to do with archaeoastronomy so much. Um, um, yeah, and, and you know, but, I mean, Andrew Collins has been attacked as well. He's writing a lot about Gebekli Tepe, and, yeah, it's it's strange. I mean, but there's there's been some actual academic papers on the movements of the stars at these sites, the movement of the sun, and things like this. There's So it's hard to refute, really, you know, and... Um, and so Andrew's very kind of sensible, really. I'm quite sensible. I'm not, I don't go off on crazy tangents. Uh, although we do go on a TV show called Ancient Aliens, which I think annoys them somewhat. Um, but we don't really talk about, we don't claim that aliens built them or anything. You know, it's not our kind of agenda. You know, we're just fascinated by it and just want to work out what the hell was going on back then. Um, you know, we think it was a very sophisticated group of people who uh, were highly innovative and probably quite shamanic. Can we talk about giants? If you like, yeah. <laughs> I I don't know very much about this. I know that there are some suggestions that there were giants, but I don't really know beyond that. So Certainly in biblical tradition. In biblical tradition, we uh And and like if we go really far back in Paleo anthropology, we, we find all of these different hominid species. I, I was actually thinking about our, we had a, a problem with our septic tank and we had a guy come out to look at it and he was telling us about the giants that soldiers were seeing in Afghanistan during the last uh, war in Afghanistan. But I don't know if, I don't know how, how deep it goes. Yeah, it's it's a strange one actually. I kind of got got into that like a few years ago quite heavily. I mean, uh, because I was I was working, I was kind of working on my own. I was looking at the megalithic sites of America, you know, New England, and I started to get interested in the mound sites. And then I just stumbled across this book by Ross Hamilton called A Tradition of Giants. Very academic, very sensible, kind of self printed kind of A four sheet staple book, which is I thought was brilliant, and it just list after list of accounts of between seven foot and 10 foot skeletons being found in the mounds. Many of them, you know, 30, 40% of them by academics, by the Smithsonian and other such things. And we're like, what? And I was like, whoa, is this for real? So I started looking into it. And then I met Jim Vieira eventually, who was been studying the stone sites of new England, like I had, and he kept coming across accounts from new England from, old academic journals from newspapers from old doctor's diaries of when they were digging the foundations they kept finding these huge skeletons and skulls sometimes with double rows of teeth and so it became a kind of fascination and we, we actually ended up writing a book called giants on record had a tv show for history channel we search for the lost giants for six episodes um investigating all this um and we, you know we're not like you know we're not fools you know we're not believers we don't just believe things for the you know ratings or to sell books or anything 
we genuinely were very, very interested in all these accounts that kept coming out, and especially because they were recorded by doctors, physicians. There, even in the Smithsonian's own annual reports from the late eighteen hundreds, there were seventeen accounts of between seven and eight foot skeletons being found. You know, and then later the Smithsonian deny they wrote them, even though they're in their own books, um, which we have copies of, by the way. Um, and so there's things like that, and then then we dug into all the accounts and we found 1500 accounts from north america alone every part of the country catalina island there's dozens of accounts uh, all everywhere i can't even ohio was the richest area uh, since then we've had other people researching and they're finding we have photos of people lying down next to like eight and a half foot tall skeletons um you know these aren't it's not made up you know some of it might be some of it might be exaggeration to sell newspapers but most of it isn't and then you look into the myths and the stories and the traditions of all these tribes and it's like oh my god that it's all in there um and so that so we kind of left that as it was we just thought okay we'll get so much criticism for it we got attacked by all these skeptics heavily attacked and we, we you know me and jim were like who cares you know we're not we'll just so we wrote another book about giants just to annoy them even more um mm -hmm. about the british giants about the stonehenge and all the stuff that's being found here and we we only had like 20 accounts from britain but we thought they were kind of interesting some of them were from proper academic journals we thought you know this is like interesting so we dug into the records and found 250 accounts in the british isles and we were like oh this is strange. None of them were acromegaly or gigantism, nor were they in North America. None of them. Maybe one was. Uh, and so that can't explain it. So we think there was a genuine tradition and lineage, maybe with the elite class, especially in North America, who bred between themselves and kept these giant genes going. And so that's that's all there is to it, I think. I don't think there's anything... Um, uh that controversial to be honest with you and then you start looking further back and now the denisovans that are being talked about they were thought to be much taller and more robust and before them their ancestors before them were the homo heidelbergensis or heidelbergensis south africa and europe they were over routinely over seven feet tall there's even a, a thigh bone found in south africa uh which proves that someone who once had that thigh bone in their thigh was 10 feet tall um and so it's there you know it's not like you know trying to kind of uh um make things up so do you think that there's a storeroom that just has all these skeletons in it somewhere uh you best ask the smithsonian uh we're not sure <laughs> oh we need all access ended up. should break into the museum <laughs> that's where they all ended up apparently and uh, we have a whole chapter called the smithsonian files um and that's why our, our TV show probably got um, cancelled because we were kind of criticising them and questioning why can't we see what's supposed to have been discovered, especially as they found you know loads of them themselves. But yeah, I find it's just a fascinating part of you know lost chapter of human history that kind of fascinated my, myself and my co-author Jim Vieira for a few years, and we got really into it. We're fascinated by the myths and the stories as well. Um, uh, especially in Britain, because there a lot of the myths and stories actually encode information about astronomy, about geomancy, about landscape technologies, about you know historical record of who these people were, where they came from, and everything else. Um, and so there, there was definitely some reality to the myths, and this was evidenced in the skeletal finds. Yeah, I wonder what kind of memories persisted, because there must have been a time on earth where there was a well there there clearly was a time on earth where there was a lot of different upright apes that were walking around doing things and and it seems like only one variety us have persisted to this day but i wonder what sort of memories linger in the cultural collective mindset collective consciousness that would remain even after even after a million years you know yeah i, I don't i mean i think i think the most compelling um is that of the Denisovans at the minute, because the Denisovan DNA has been found in North America, uh, especially the northern climes of North America, uh, quite a high percentage in some of the native tribes there, native cultures. And um, I think that's the compelling, because uh, 
there's now it's highly likely they were very tall they were like seven foot kind of people from siberia and also they had a different brain capacity a larger brain capacity and it's thought they may have had um, a different level of intelligence and innovation going on and now there's a strong theory of a, even a connection between southeast turkey and siberia with all the symbology and um agricultural development even though the denisovans are much much earlier there's something there's something going on i mean I, they keep finding all these obscure ref, obscure jaw bones and teeth in various places around the world which look very much like a human and yet they're claiming they're not human they're some other you know ape-like man yeah we were talking before we started filming about america a little bit and there's something really perplexing about the layout of civilization in the Americas, where we have this story of the peopling through the Arctic area, let's say, but all of the first cities and and the big monumental architecture and the masonry starts in the deep south, which is very perplexing to me. Do you, do you have any idea why there there doesn't seem to be that kind of stonework in the north? Yes, that is an order. I mean, I don't know if it's just to do with there wasn't much about stone wise. I just don't know. I mean, they found, well, I've been talking to Greg Little and Andrew Collins about this because they researched the mound, especially Greg researched the mound sites of North America. And they've now found mounds, very large earthen mounds, shaped pyramid shapes. They go back nine or 10,000 years easily uh, in North America, which is astonishing, you know. But if you look to the Northeast, like New England and New York State, there are megalithic structures. There are many of them. Um, there, in one of the most fascinating examples, is, is a balanced rock or North Salem Dolmen in New York State. A giant megalithic structure, a dolmen. You go into um, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, everywhere else. They, there's dozens of these megalithic chambers, like Gunji Womp. Um, you've got calendar one and two in Vermont. You've got numerous ones all over the place. And these are quite big. They've got multi-ton stones. They're aligned to the solstices and things like this. No one knows who built them. There's evidence in the historical record that even when the first settlers came in and they tried to communicate with the Native Americans, they didn't know who built them either. So it was before long before anything that was known about um and so you have things like this anomalies like this going on you actually have stone structures in some of the mounds you actually have like megalithic um kind of uh foundations like large stone slabs creating small chambers in some of the mounds these so-called giants were found found in um in uh, west virginia and so forth also serpent mound there was a quite a large megalith at the very top of serpent mound that's now fallen down the side you can actually go and see it if you have someone to show you where it is uh things like this and so uh um as to why stone wasn't used so much uh, i think it's more a case of using what was available and uh, i don't know i don't know how or why south america and you know central america had such a prevalence of megalithic architecture what while some areas didn't it's, it's a bit of a mystery um that's yet to be solved really i mean there might be some climate contribution to that too i imagine i mean the we lived in new york city for a while and it's it's rough living in the winter out there i, I wonder if there isn't just a tendency for people to have just kept moving and, and developed it, but but then again the the mountainous regions in in chile and on the west coast of south america get get pretty chilly too up there in the mountains and of course people were building you know you mm. have you have all sorts of uh pre-incan civilization up in the high plains and it all it doesn't yeah, it doesn't totally compute it's very very strange it, a lot of this doesn't compute does it it's very i mean you start looking trying to understand the kind of what came first as well i mean the, the people the, the, there's just so many anomalies with the dating of everything as well um which is frustrating i mean one of the most solid datings unfortunately Quebecly tepe and carahan tepe these were like really properly done um by the german archaeological institute you know multiple tests and everything else um so we know that's pretty solid but everywhere else is now open to interpretation i think even um they're even finding evidence this stonehenge now i mean this has been known about for a while 
that there i mean where i live you know i'm right in the heart of the landscape here this um is has been occupied occupied constantly for ten thousand years it's the only place in the country that has there's actually large make huge size post holes found right next to stonehenge that date back to eight thousand or so bc you know things like this is a site called blick mead just literally up there um which is um a kind of flint production area with this beautiful spring that actually turns the algae turns the stones pink which is interesting um and uh uh that's ten thousand years old as well at least and so um and yet stonehenge itself is only five thousand years old or so or less you know so you know things like that are a bit a bit of anomalous in their own right yeah, and there's there's interesting parallels between things happening in the Americas and happening in the old world. One of the most disturbing things I came across recently was, and I can't remember the name of the civilization, but it was by the lake there, uh, this pre-Incan civilization. What was the name of that lake? The very, very central Incan. Lake Titicaca. There you go, there you go, Titicaca. Uh, but they there was beautiful masonry in this pre-Incan civilization, like unbelievable, actually in terms of the, the megaliths that were there. And one thing that's very, very strange is the masonry techniques made use of these, uh, I guess they call them eye clamps, I think. They're these pieces of bronze that join, uh, they carve little grooves in the tops of the blocks so that they can withstand seismic uh, disturbances, I guess, and still remain intact. But the exact same eye clamp technique was used around the same time in Greece and in Egypt in some of the temples there. And, mm. you know, the archaeologists are like, well, people come up with the same idea, in, you know, unrelatedly. But it's just so identical looking that it just troubles me. It's just like, it's, it's, I want to believe that, that humans would invent the same thing, but it just is, it's so, I, it's so similar. Like, I could think of many ways to join stones that would be similar, but not exactly the same. And it's just so bizarre that they would have the, this masonry technique at the same moment, more or less, uh, on opposite sides of this enormous ocean. Well, we came across something else that was really similar to that with the ancient city of Shimao in northern China, where they were doing digs. And I think National Geographic posted an article where they had a photograph of one of the stones that was in the retaining wall of this massive city. And it looks so Mesoamerican. It has the same Mayan style of carvings with the same sort of serpent god in it. And what's weird is that we, uh, we talked to the guy from UCLA who's working on that site. And he's like, yeah, we don't actually think that those stones came from Shima. We think that it came from something before Shimao, which they think that because the stones that have these Mesoamerican style carvings on them are kind of placed haphazardly in the retaining wall of the city. Like some of them are upside down. They're in like weird orientations. They're interspersed with other bricks. And then he's like, we have no evidence of who came before that could have been building in this style. And our explanation for how it is that the ancient Chinese had the same stylistic architecture was uh, the human subconscious. It's like the Levi Strauss idea that like they're they just were licking, seeing... They were both licking toads and they saw the, the same... The same kind of toad. In the same style. And <laughs> it's just very hard to swallow. And yet there's no you know, coherent explanation for contacts between these peoples. And it's just it's very... I, guess, I, I wonder if there's anybody who's trying to work out a map of how all of these cultures could be related to each other temporally and physically. Like, assuming that, like, I know that we have the dates, and the dates are more or less fixed for some places. I'm like, what if the dates had more wiggle room in them? Is there someone who is looking stylistically at how all of these things are related to one another and trying to put together a master plan of cultural evolution? Once again, I think that's another job that you're kind of uh, going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a bit, uh, but yeah, no, this is, I think people have, co you know, I've commented on that as well. I mean, um, several several researchers have, not just me, I'm not, you know, making any claims on it. But uh, one of the things that I noticed immediately was um, you mentioned these sort of clamps, these uh, what are called keystone cuts in some places. Um, they're fascinating, but the polygonal walls, 
finding not just in Peru and Egypt, but also Italy, Greece, Albania, Japan, other places. Um, but one of the fascinating things for me, I mean, there's, there's a couple actually, some of the 3D relief carvings we find in Southeast Turkey, Gebekli Tepe and so forth, are identical to what you find at the Chilpa sites around Lake Titicaca of Patimbo and Silustani, for instance. Uh, weirdly identical, same style. It's like, what the hell? You also have an anomaly that was found next to Lake Titicaca in um, the late 1950s, early 1960s, called the Fuente Magna Bowl, which is now on display in La Paz Museum in Bolivia. And this has um, a Mara script on it, and it also has Sumerian and Proto-Sumerian script on it. Like It's like a Rosetta Stone translation. Wow, really? It's made out of sandstone, yeah, and this, um, and no one's been able to explain that apart from that it's a hoax. But it was found in the late mm. '60s, and it was used to feed pigs, um, and then it got broken and put back together, and eventually it got recognised and taken to the museum. And so the fact that it was just randomly found by the side of late, you know, like twenty miles from Tiwanaku, you know, like what, what is thing. Maru, by the way? You said it had a Maru uh, script. Is that a Polynesian? Amara, Amara, Amara. That's the local indigenous uh, oh, that's people, right. I see it. Amaria, yeah. and um, and so yes, yeah, so that's a fascinating discovery linking the Sumerians with ancient Peru, Bolivia, Lake Titicaca area, um, which is utterly bizarre, you know. But th that's more compelling than anything because it's like a possible direct link. Um, and so, and yeah, and then when you start, you can you can make comparisons all day long. There's so many things you could compare and blow your mind with like the hands of the easter island statues on the navel hands on the navel gebekli tepe for instance the kind of abstract forms that they both have the fact that many of these places like gebekli tepe easter island stonehenge olmec sites everywhere Baalbek leave the largest stones in the quarry as like a marker the birthplace of the temple um you know, things like this. There's all these comparisons that have been constantly made. There's the mathematics, there's the geometry, there's the number, there's the uh, the, the advanced metrology, the, the number measurement systems they were using, which is something I've, I've focused on at the minute. I'm writing, writing about that at the moment, about Tepe and Karahan Tepe, that the same number of measurement systems are used in different parts of the world which suggests there's a direct connection, or they both had an understanding of the size and shape of the Earth. Um, which again is a whole other story. Um, the fact is, we're finding the sa I'm finding the same geometry at the enclosures at Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe as we find in the stone circles of the British Isles. Identical, you know, not not so identical. The same measurement systems: the megalithic yard, the Sumerian foot, the Assyrian foot, the Royal Egyptian cubit, all found at the same places. It doesn't make any sense, you know. So you go you go beyond the visible and you go into the invisible aspects, like I've been describing, and you could go on with that. You could go into the astronomy: the fact that they're following the same stars, they're following the same. They w all want to focus on the solstices. They all want to um, use shadow play within their designs and things like this um it just really does make you wonder and i really now i really believe it was all really innovating at gobekli tepe and karahan tepe and the influences are infinite and were found across the planet yeah the influences are interesting because one of the standard arguments against any sort of transmission of knowledge is that there's no genetic linkage between you know the South American or the Mesoamerican peoples and, you know, the old world and so forth. So if they were in contact, why aren't they breeding with each other? Something like that. But the idea, the, the, the thought that ideas travel faster than people is an interesting concept to explore there. Well, you've also got the fact that they found cocaine in the mummies of Egypt and tobacco. Um, so there's definitely a some kind of connection between South America and Egypt, for instance. I mean, that's one of the famous ones. And so how do you explain that? You know, um, you know, there's, there's so many things like this, but to me, it's like, you start looking at the numbers, you start looking at the, the, the orientation of sites, you start looking at the, the size and shape of sites. And that's where, that's where the real kind of secret knowledge is, you know, in my opinion, that's a very really kind of, um, um, you know, to me, that's what the elites understood that's what the elite 
priestly elites, they understood the astronomy, the movement of the stars, they understood when things were going to happen in the sky and could pretend to predict that. They understood the geometry, the measurements, and this was the these were, these are all universal kind of uh, languages that I've just been describing there. Anyone in the world can all follow these principles and all be exactly the same. You can't with language, you can't with hieroglyphs, you can't with written form, because no one can understand one from the other. Um, and they were making attempts, obviously, on the Fuente Magna Bowl. But there's also, like, um, suggestions that inside Gebekli Tepe, uh, something JJ's been looking at, and also Robert Shog looked at this as well, and, and a good friend Manu, who uh, has got a very complicated surname I can't pronounce. And he they did a paper on the what they believe some of the symbols in Gebekli Tepe are part of the ancient Luwian language, which is the Hittite language. Now, the problem is there's a seven or 8,000 year difference between Gebekli Tepe and the later Hittites who are in the same, roughly the same region. And so how does that make sense? How can eight, seven or 8,000 years um, make any sense when you find the same symbols and possibly the same meaning? So maybe there is, that you can have connections even from these great distances in time. Oh, that reminds me of a really fascinating story that we haven't looked into yet, but uh, Shiloh's dad went to this lecture in Sedona by a guy who's been taking photographs of petroglyphs with a series of filters, and he saw that they seemed almost like Chinese writing, and then he showed them to scholars of ancient Chinese, and they were like, yeah, this, you can, they look a lot like ancient Chinese writing and you can actually interpret them to, to be signs that were used in these ancient languages. But there's no clear indication of how they could have formed the same signs without there being contact, but there's no evidence for contact. And so you have yeah, that's all the of these thing little is like, clues. Can you, can you shine any lights on why these people would have been exchanging ideas and symbology and, and knowledge without breeding with one another? Or are our genetic maps just incomplete? Like, because the way that we operate is genetic linkages are shown through these single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? So you look at a genome, you look at the specific sites in the genome, and you're like, okay, so this population has these mutations, this population has that mutation. But, I mean, all this old DNA is pretty degraded. And so it's possible that our maps of these relationships just aren't as, as good as we think they are. Because it's not like you can pull a full genome off of something that's 12,000 years old and to, to some great depth of sequencing and be able to reassemble the whole thing. Like, that's not the level of specificity I also wonder if that it, we're operating yeah, with. I, I also wonder if it, I wonder if it, there wasn't some cultural, what's the word? Prohib Stig yeah, yeah. Prohibition. Prohibition or stigma against interbreeding between these different racial groups you know if somebody shows up on a boat from polynesia to to ancient um, south america if there would have been you know they both would have had too much pride to exchange genes uh, i don't know i'm just i want, I want to, to solve this mystery because it's it seems to be the reason that most academics when you talk to them about this thing they sort of laugh at you because they're just like well there's no way they would have we would we would see their genes in the population if they were actually having contact with one another. Yeah, uh, and the problem with that is if they're testing people in modern times, we're a global, global, you know, civilization now, so everything's all mixed up. So it's hard that, I guess that would be harder to evaluate. But there's lots of, I mean, I, I don't know about that, but they, they've done DNA testing on, you know, coming in from Turkey to Britain, and they found a gradual progress and they proved it. Um, even when Doggerland was still existing between Britain and Europe and things like this. And so I'm sure there's, I mean, there's Denisovan DNA they're finding in North American, Native American cultures, uh, even finding it in other parts of the world now. So they know there was Denisovan, you know, they were moving about, there was migrations and everything else. I mean, I'm not really an expert on this. So I can't really comment any further, but I think, um, I'm sure more will be found, you know. I mean, I'm fascinated by the Olmec, so is JJ, um, of, of, of Mexico. And uh, and there's a lot of debate about them, you know, about were they interbreeding with different cultures from across the planet, possibly from Africa, po possibly from Polynesia, possibly coming up from the south as well, even from North America and other areas. I mean, that's been a massive controversy for quite a long time. Um and I think they found evidence of that now in the DNA as well. Uh, there was a lot of movement 
around uh, the planet more so than people realize um and they found some very ancient boats and sh- kind of tr- you know you can move across oceans with going back thousands of years now i believe tens of thousands of years in some cases yeah i feel like i've said this before but i feel like the future of archaeology must must involve underwater exploration but of course the ocean probably has a tendency to destroy everything that that falls to the bottom of it very quickly like i wonder how long the titanic will even be there you know yeah there's i mean graham hancock's the guy to talk to he did a brilliant book called underworld and he yeah i love that book and uh, and also um there's been more more coming out about that but it's not really it's not really it doesn't feel like it's pretty much looked at you know by academia i don't know why um i guess it's a tough place to explore i mean i think but, that's it yeah i think it's just it's the same the types of people that are doing academic research are not the same types of people that are doing adventure high risk activities like diving i just think that it's expensive I think that in order to to outfit a ship and to be able to spend the amount of time that you need to spend in order to find something, you basically have to have somebody with really deep pockets who's going to continue to fund you for maybe a decade or more while you search and not find anything. And it's like, really good, you have to have a really strong hypothesis, right? Because the ocean's enormous, so you need to know where to look. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like a lot of archaeology, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of it is just, hey... This farmer stumbles across this this chunk of something in a field, and oh my God, there's this whole civilization here, and it's like that's not going to happen at the bottom of the ocean. You need to really go looking for something dedicatedly. Yeah. Well, I think well, thank God for Atlantis, eh? You know, everyone wants to go and find that. So uh, <laughs> I think James Cameron was doing that recently as well, wasn't he? In the last decade I didn't or so. Interesting. You know, whole project. But 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 they're doing LIDAR of jungles and landscapes, which is very good. Um, but it doesn't really penetrate into the ground, so it's useless around Car- Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Uh, but very useful in places like the Amazon, which they're finding all these geometric earthworks, which some that date back to 10,000 years. And also the jungles of Mexico and Guatemala, um, astonishing stuff coming out of there that they're realizing they you know huge civilizations much larger than they thought in maya and olmec times which again is another fascinating area to uh, explore i mean this is one of the creepiest and strangest things about ancient archaeology is that we have a sense of our security on the basis of our material prosperity We've built so much and look at our cities and look at our roads and look at our technology and we're here to stay. And you go back into the deep past and you realize that, you know, it's not like there's a couple of cities in the Yucatan Peninsula. It's tens of thousands of dwellings that are interconnected with roads, huge populations that are just gone. The stories of them are gone, their histories are gone. And it really chills me to the bone to think of not being the spear point of progress but yet another branching path that might just dissolve into the blowing winds of the desert yeah i mean i mean i think that the underwater stuff is the stuff that's going to get most lost i mean the 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 coasts have changed so much haven't they uh you're talking about hancock stuff it's just astonishing you know when you consider there was a land mass between britain and europe the size of ireland you know uh there's around malta was joined to sicily for instance and things like this and they found this 40 foot megalith that dates back to seven and a half thousand bc in off the coast of sicily 400 feet under the water um and little things just big things like this which are just like what you know um stone circles that appear to be under the water off the coast of orkney which they've now been discovering as well um you know graham phillips a good friend of ours has been doing written a book about that um so yeah so the list is endless but i mean i think thankfully gebekli tepe and karahan tepe and the taz tepe sites were carefully buried or accidentally buried in some cases and so they're being they've been preserved and they're just waiting to be dug up yeah and so is that going to be where your main focus is going forward 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've got this little book out, but I'm working on a larger book with JJ Ainsworth, and we're going to be. Um, I mean, we're cracking into it now. Actually, we're going to hopefully have it out sometime late next year, perhaps. And uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, because we, we're approaching it from many, from many of the angles we've discussed today, actually. Um, but going, we were very. JJ's very um, focused on ancient very ancient mythology you know we're talking super ancient mythology like going back hundreds of thousands of years in some cases um and uh also the goddess symbolism of Mar the work of maria gimbutas and others um and we're kind of combining our kind of research i'm very much i'm very focused on um the geometry i'm uncovering the gebekli tepe and karate and the ancient metrology so quite different perspectives but they do meet strangely um when you understand the symbolism of the geometries or the symbolism of the numbers it all fits in with these myths and so yeah i mean the fact that it shows this technical very beautiful accurate uh harmonious side to uh these sites and temples i believe i believe they are many of them the main ones are temples they were religious they were spiritual sacred places and there's a very good re there's multiple reasons why that's the case um and then you see that there's the mythology and the symbolism and you can actually look at other mythologies in the area and you can see that you feel like they're almost talking about a memory they had of something that was there you know and like so we're just trying to piece this all together um and uh and and you start yeah you start looking at the kind of um the way everything you know i mean the history's got to be completely rewritten unfortunately poor poor old academics because what's coming out of the ground in southeast turkey is doing that it's rewriting it all. it has to there's no there's no other way it's not me i'm not pushing for that it just is going to happen that's the nature of it because we're talking like a super civilization nearly twelve thousand years ago the end of the last ice age this is like profound mm. this is something people were just speculating upon about the sphinx for instance john anthony west and robert shock they were oh maybe it's as old as ten thousand bc and so forth but no now it's proven there is this stuff this era and so and the fact is so sophisticated so influential and the innovation that occurred there is just nothing there's nothing on par with it until the time of the sumerians or the egyptians or the stonehenge builders so it's definitely going to be my focus yeah for a, a, a very long time i think especially because new discoveries are going to be keep being made sure. that, that gap too between the two is something that's just of endless fascination to me like that so many thousands of years would pass between these civilizations like what was going on it's just because like, i haven't I mean, you think so you, you think right just think about this right you're building the pyramids like 2600 bc all right gebekli tepe was 9600 bc yeah so when you're building the pyramids the last surviving wonder of the world we're talking like what's that seven thousand years difference you know and like even when they covered it up there was still six five or six thousand years between them so it's like what the hell yeah. you know it's uh, it's just so baffling because you know so we see things as ancient but when they were building these made like stonehenge sumerian civilization you know uh egyptians everyone gobekli uh, tepe was super ancient then and it had been forgotten about by them even isn't even it's maybe just lingering legends and myths you know uh and things like this um and so yeah so uh, yeah it's just uh, it's just absolutely uh mind-blowing when you consider that it's a really really cool story so who should we be talking to next by the way mm. uh, i'd love to talk to jj too if, if she would sit down with us i'm really interested in the mythology side of things too but yeah, definitely. She's, yeah, she's very smart, but she's, she, she, she yeah, I, I'll ask her on your behalf uh, for sure. Uh, maybe I'll show her this interview, see if she, she's quite shy, so she doesn't like to kind of go on for talk for too long. It was like, I could, I could talk for England, you know, the, the Olympics, you know, and uh, but there's, uh, yeah, and uh, but yeah, so that, yeah, but yeah, if, you know, if you can get her to talk, she is quite brilliant, you know, her kind of take on it. She's been studying, um, she's very focused on mythology and symbolism and her take on it is unique. There's no one I know, which I'm very fortunate, she's my partner, who, who can do this, who can actually kind of decode this. She's actually, she can read, you know, 
certain hieroglyphs and the Louis and script and things like this. And um, so it's quite remarkable. And her work she's now doing on uh, something called the um, uh, the Golden Gate of the Ecliptic and the symbolism she's noting that he's found within Gebekli Tepe as well, which no one's really worked out before. So she's got some unique takes on it. Um, I mean, there's many very, very interesting researchers. I don't, I'm not hundred percent who you've had on the show. My good friend, Andrew Collins, um, uh, he's fascinating in his own right. He's a kind of legendary figure in the ancient mysteries world. Uh, but there's many others um, I could recommend. So we can we can certainly talk about that. My good friend Howard Crowhurst, he's very much into the geometry, landscape engineering and astronomy of Karnak in Brittany, but was also relating it. He's finding the same systems in place in places like Giza and other places in the world. Um, but yeah, we can certainly I can certainly recommend a few remarkable people to you. Yeah, 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 if you think of anybody, you know, later on, we'd love to hear about it. It's We've been doing a lot of basic science on this show so far, a lot of physics and origins of life, consciousness, things that are more, you know, contemporary research, but we're just cracking open this ancient history thing uh, in full force. So yeah, any recommendations, we would, we would love to find out who, who would be fun to talk to. So please drop us a line. Sure, no worries. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, send. I've got a list of people in my mind already. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it'd be fantastic. Awesome. And we'd love to talk to you when you when you have your book written. We can we can look over it, and then once it's done, maybe have you and JJ back together if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll, we'll we're gonna keep we're keeping on track with that, and I think JJ would uh, prefer that if I was we were doing it together. Um, but yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I mean, if you're interested, you can see one of our brand new article we've just published on GrahamHancock.com. Right. He's just uh, published it for us as part two of a series um, about about the mythology and symbolism surrounding the Winter Solstice at Karahan Tepe. Um, and uh we have it's not complete i mean we've got more information than we put in the article quite a lot more but we couldn't we couldn't do a fifteen thousand word article it wasn't <laughs> appropriate for the website i think people just turn off after uh, oh, yeah. first few thousand words um but yeah and people can you know um i mean i summarize it quite um efficiently in the the new book even though it's quite a small book uh show you how big it is it's quite small it's just this size mm. but we summarize it pretty uh, as much as we can pretty tightly and there are lots of graphics and it's more of a kind of um um a condensed it's like a condensed large book into a small book because uh, you have to you start off writing a book that's about five times the size and you have to kind of <laughs> edit it down really concisely the editor is really intense works really intensely with me to get it correct so it's a, a part of a, the wooden book series i'm not sure if you've seen them they're, they're quite brilliant so i'm delighted to have uh, yet another book published um, by that publisher that's fantastic uh so if people want to read more about your work where, th where should they go yeah, they can. Uh, I'm all over the place, actually. I mean, I've got tons of videos on on our Megalithomania UK YouTube channel. Uh, there's people can just Google Hugh Newman, and they'll find tons of stuff. I've got articles up on ancientorigins.net, GrahamHancock.com. But my most um, the, the main website I manage is Megalithomania.co.uk. And on there, it's got. It's mainly that's mainly the events. Um, we run the conferences and the tours and videos a couple of articles but mainly the articles we put out on other other kind of platforms um but we're all over social media if people want to kind of find us from that perspective um but fundamentally i mean i've got several books out so people can check them out they can just find me on amazon and, and various places and jj if people are interested her uh youtube and sort of profile is megalithic maiden and so they can kind of find more information about her through that and um yeah and uh that's that's about it but there's uh there's plenty online but there's also several books as well that's fantastic i, I really really appreciate you coming by it's been it's been fascinating really eye-opening yeah, yeah, nice for giving us great. so much of your time yeah appreciate it it's been a lovely interview thank you thank All you so have much. a great rest of your day sir great to meet you all right no worries. Okay. Bye. bye bye everybody